Test, test. No, that's for our student trustee. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Oh, these are really working tonight. <laughs> but I will try to lean in because I know sometimes I step back and no one can hear me. So, um, welcome everybody to the September 12, 2018 PVOSD board meeting. We're glad to see you here. Um, we will go ahead and get started with item 3.1, and that's our Pledge of Allegiance, and Trustee Orozco has agreed to lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. So again, I just wanted to um, welcome everybody. We're going to go to superintendent comments, and um, I'll go ahead and make my uh, welcome comments during the rest of the board comments section. So um, go ahead, Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, please. Yes, and if anybody in our audience would like translation services, we do have our s translator back here. If you'd like to uh, see her, she does have equipment that will um, uh, will provide translation for the entire meeting. Si alguien ocupa servicio de traducción, a la señorita Virginia puede ayudarle con eso. Okay, well, thank you. So we had a wonderful first month of school in PVUSD. Our construction projects were completed on time and um, before school started. And we'll be showcasing several of the locations in a bus tour on Friday, September 21st from 12.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. So hemos tenido un maravilloso primer mes de escuelas en PVUSD. Um, nuestros proyectos de construcción eran completo a tiempo y antes de comenzar a la escuela. Um, vamos a mostrar varios de esos lugares en un recorrido de autobús el viernes 21 de septiembre, empezando a dos y media hasta cuatro y media. And we've invited our board members, local officials, media, community partners, and parents to attend. And so if you'd like to participate in the tour, please contact um, Alicia Jimenez, our public information officer, to sign up. So, hemos invitado a nuestros miembros de la mesa directiva, funcionarios locales, medios de comunicación, socios de la comunidad y padres a asistir. Si desea participar en la guía, comuni puede comunicarse con Alicia Jiménez, nuestra oficial de información pública, para apuntarse. So, we're starting another reading campaign using the Footsteps to Brilliance application. 
our program Paso a Paso has already extended the instructional time of our students by 15,000 hours, which translates in over 33 million words. And the winning class with the most time outside of the instructional day will win a set of 10 iPads. And so good luck to all of our students. Um, so hemos comenzado otro, otra campaña de lectura usando la aplicación de Footsteps to Brilliance. Y no están las palabras ahí. Entonces, con este programa de paso a paso, hemos extendido el tiempo instruccional de nuestros estudiantes por 15 mil horas de instrucción. Y este produce 33 millones de palabras. Y la clase que gana esta campaña va a dar, um, con tiempo afuera de la, del salón, va a ganar un, um, un set de 10 iPads. En so, buena suerte a todos los estudiantes. Thank you so much. Um, so um, now we're going to move on to 3.5, and this is really exciting for all of us. Um, each year, um, we have a student trustee um, who represents all of our high school students here um, on the board. And I'm very, very excited to, um, to introduce yeah. Rosalie Jimenez. Um, she's right down here at the end. So we're going to do a little ceremonial swearing in for you, and then I'll give you a moment to introduce yourself and um, maybe share a little bit about yourself. So, okay? Okay, we're going to come up here. Okay. Okay, can you hear us? Rosalie, this is um, a certificate of Oath of Office. Um, so you're going to be sworn in as the unofficial student trustee of the TVUSD. Um, so you're going to uh, repeat after me. I'm going to raise your right hand. Okay. I, Rosalie Jimenez. I, Rosalie Jimenez. Do solemnly swear that I will defend the Constitution of the United States. Do solemnly swear that I will defend the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies. And the Constitution of the United of the State of California against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Excellent, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. So let me get, wait right here. I got it. <laughs> um, so, hello. Um, I would like to start by thanking my principal, Ms. Pugh, for recommending me to apply to, the, to become student trustee. And I am so humbled and honored to have been entrusted with this responsibility to represent fellow PBUSD students and to be able to voice their wishes and opinions directly to the council. So thank you very much to Ms. Pugh and as well as Dr. Rodriguez and Alicia Jimenez. So it brings me much joy to be part of a council to, that works to better our school so that every individual can have the best experience possible, meaning having great memories and a fantastic support system as well, which is most important, a proper, to properly prepare them for their futures. 
So I look forward to communicating with students and the council to, con to continue to ad advance this goal. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much and welcome. Um, so we're gonna move on to our high school uh, student uh, representatives. And um, we have Aptos High here and we also have David and Denise, but I didn't get which schools you're from. So let's start with David and if you can uh, introduce yourself and say what school you're from and give us your report. Thank you. Good evening, President Leslie DeRose, Dr. Rodriguez, and fellow board members. My name is Daniel Rocha Hernandez, and I'm the AESB Vice President and School Representative at Pajaro Valley High School for the 2018-19 school year. Uh, well, in academics, we have started a program called PBIS that has been enforced by our Assistant Principal, Mr. Wilson. Uh, this program rewards students who are responsible, active, and academically strong. Students get claw dollars, and they use them to purchase any item at our Grizzly store. Uh, we also have new classes that have been very successful, such as band, sports med, and leadership for ninth grade students. And we also have an ethnic studies, an ethnic studies class, which is very successful. And students and staff are extremely excited with the new changes at our school. Um, some of our activities, this past month we had our cross town rival game, which was our whiteout. Our student section was super active and showcased the amazing school spirit that PV Nation has. With cheers and a crowded student section that never sat down, we brought home the Belgard Cup megaphone for the third year in a row. We also had freshman orientation at the beginning of August, which was a big success. The orientation is ran by Link Crew, which are upperclassmen that help the freshmen get familiar with the campus, um, staff and admin, and give an abundance of advice. Also in August, we had our first time ever senior barbecue, which was held in the upper parking lot. At the barbecue, we had lots of games that brought out the five-year-old within us. Um, there was plenty of food, drinks, and desserts. The barbecue was hosted by ASB with the sole purpose of gathering the class of 2019 right before the start of our last high school year. And in athletics, our football team has been working extremely hard. They're dedicated and they want to be the best. Our cross country team has been off to a very fast start as well. Um, Coach Ms. G says, this is definitely one of our best group. They are extremely motivated and want to be the best. Our girls volleyball team has been off to a good start as well. They won their first league game yesterday against North Monterey County on a three set run. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Denise. My name is Denise Gonzalez. I am a senior at Renaissance High School. Um, good evening to the board president, trustees, and superintendent Rodriguez. It is my pleasure to share with you this evening. I want you to learn more about my school and what it means to me. At Renaissance High, I've experienced feeling secure and confident. I learned how to be a student until I attended to Renaissance. Renaissance has a lot of opportunities to earn credits. Learning is fun and creative, full of different experiences. Classes are great and open to culture and different things that you could learn. There are some classes like Raza Literature that will make you feel proud of who you are and identify you better. Renaissance provides hands-on classes which are really fun. Some examples are woodshop, garden class, art, and technology. All of these classes not just include fun, they also include challenges and skills. Also, one great thing that I like about Renaissance is that they have small classes and a lot of help from teachers. Staff and teachers get concerned with work behavior and student levels on a daily basis. Renaissance is great for me, great field trips and activities. I feel safe at Renaissance. Um, the environment there, I could call it as if it was my second home, and I feel really comfortable here with all the teachers and the new principal. He is very well to work with, too. Thank you, and we're glad that you're here. And Aptos, hi. Go ahead and come up and make sure to state your name so we all know who you are. Thanks for being here. Hello. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, good evening. I'm Gage, and this is Riley Many, Sophia Gonzalez, and Kalai Cost. 
I would like to thank the Board of Trustees and the Superintendent for having us here today. We are the representatives from Aptos High and we are going to be telling you what's been going on recently at Aptos High. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it works on this? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, Aptos High students in the CIMI club had, and the people in the marine biology had the chance to go to Catalina and study marine life. And uh, Portland State University representative came today at lunch to talk to the people at uh, school. And the co College and Career Center, we've been having college representatives come and um, tell students about the school a little bit. We also have Steve Shapiro come speak at Aptos High about paying for college tonight and Aptos High PAC Center. So Aptos High is known for its amazing arts classes. Uh, arts classes this year including drawing and painting, beginning band and drum line. Um, in addition, choir will present their annual coffee house talent show um, on Saturday, October 6th and all students are welcome to come and participate so that's a really good way for students who aren't involved in choir to come perform. Um, the theater program will be performing The Adams Family for our fall musical in the PAC. And opening night is October 27th, and they will have shows intermittently until November 3rd. So as a new class this year, Aptos has offered ASB leadership to ninth and 10th graders instead of just having it for 11th and 12th graders. On August 28th, we had a successful club rush and our first club carnival will be this Friday. Aptos High's homecoming week will be on September 24th through the 28th and our theme is classic movies. The parade will take place on, in Aptos Village on September 26th and the rally and game itself will be on September 28th. Um, our football team won their first home game last Friday against Monta Vista, and they are currently 3-0. and Our volleyball team just finished preseason, currently 2-3, and and our first league game is tomorrow. Um, boys and girls water polo had their first games on Monday, and the girls won against Santa Cruz. Um, tennis is also doing well. They are currently 2-0 and and have another match on Friday, and our golf, our girls' golf team and our co cross country team are preparing for season. So Aptos High has implemented a new program this year called PBIS, and that stands for Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. And it's basically a school-wide program that sets up expectations and reinforcement of positive behavior. And students are um, learning these expectations through the acronym SAIL, which stands for Safe community, aspire higher, integrity oriented, and lead by example. And we're hoping that by abiding to this mindset, students will have a more fulfilling experience and achieve their goals. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks again for being here. I'm really happy about the music. I hope you guys are too. <laughs> the whole board is. We've been really wanting that for you for a long time. Yep. So student reps, <clears throat> excuse sure. me. You guys can stay and watch this very riveting board meeting <laughs> because it's educational or you could go home and do homework. So you are not required to stay, but we thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item 3.6, and that is comments for the board on committee's um, updates. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Trustee Ursino. Thank you, Trustee DeRose. Um, 
I don't have any updates. <laughs> so. Okay. We'll go from there. Trustee Acosta. I don't have any comments at this time. Thank you. Yes. I guess I can help. <laughs> um, well, the only thing I'm doing, I'm trying to go to the open houses. And so um, I did, I, I don't know if I screwed up on the Ohlone. Somebody told me I, it already happened. That sounds terrible. But I went to the Radcliffe open house. And when I go, I go to every single classroom. And they had a, they actually had a video today. So um, Uli made sure that I was be able to into one of the classrooms to be able to see the video, um, that I could be there for the video, which was really good. And there, each teacher is, 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 it was really great this time, is talking about everything that they're doing in, in, every, in, in all the big subjects and stuff like that. Anyways, it was really fun to listen to what all the teachers are doing in their classrooms. Thanks. <laughs> Karen, you're busy. You're going to every classroom. That's great. I do. I always do. <laughs> I, um, I attended two open houses um, in the last... Since the last time we met, I was at um, Aptos High where my daughter is a senior, and I'm sorry, Peggy Pugh, that I was not there to make my remarks. I got caught in traffic on the way back from San Francisco, but I did go into all the, a lot of the classrooms, and I'm so impressed oh, with good. some of the new hires that have been made at Aptos High, in particular the new biolo biology teacher I thought was just really great. And, um, anyway, you have, you've got a great staff there, and the classrooms looked great. And so i um, looking forward to continuing to improve the science classrooms, et cetera, and the campus. Um, secondly, went to Valencia, where I, where I did make it in time to make remarks, and that was a lot of fun. Um, it was great to see their like, family there, and I did go into many of the classrooms there, so I was happy to do that. And It looks like um, we're, we're off to a good start. Our construction projects did wrap up, and um, I'm, I'm very um, pleased with um, the district's uh, response to getting everything done in the time of start of school, so thank you. No comments. Uh, thank you. Um, last uh, Thursday night, I had the opportunity to go to three back to school nights, Minty White, Radcliffe, Watsonville High School. And Friday night, Watsonville High School football played, um, who did we play? Oh, uh, St. Francis High School. And, and it's so much fun because you had the opportunity to meet and listen to parents, kids. And as I campaign, it is, it is probably the most fun that I've ever had because it is exciting when you knock on the door because you never know, never know what you're going to get. And most of it is very positive very uplifting and and I think that every election should be a fully fought over um, race we should we should always have a um, election where you have to go out and explain and justify everything that you you, you have been doing and it takes a while, but it's also very, very fair. And listening is a big part of that. So I, so I just want people to know that when I come knocking, open the door, let us in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Um, so I, I don't remember if I had mentioned this last time I was here, but um, I did attend the Belgard Cup football game with Trustee Yehiro, that's Watsonville PV High, and we got to judge the Spirit Award, which was really fun. Uh, we spent uh, the first half on one side of the field with Watsonville High and the second half with PV High, and PV High won the Spirit Award, which was great. Um, I went to the Mar Vista Back to School Barbecue, where my, um, my grandnephew goes that lives with me, so um, I get to go to that school uh, often. Uh, we also had our first intergovernmental inter affairs meeting uh, last week with the city of Watsonville, 
our county supervisors and PVUSD. We had a great turnout and I'm really looking forward uh, to collaborative efforts coming forward. Um, some of the uh, items that we agreed that we're going to be working on together are proactive coordination on development projects, so new housing that might be coming up. We're going to be a part of those conversations. Explore partnerships on funding programs and facility and field use and just enhancing communications between the county, PVUSD, and the city of Watsonville, which is going to benefit us all. So I'm really um, excited about that, um, that partnership moving forward. Saturday, uh, I went to PV High for a cleanup that they had. And um, uh, Saturday morning, 6.30, a little hard to get out of bed, but boy, was I happy I did when I got there. Um, the front, uh, PV High has a, a club called Friends of the Swallows. I'm sure we all remember what happens when swallows nest. So um, our CBO, Joe Dominguez, was there as well, and we scrubbed a lot of um, surfaces, I'm just going to say. Um, <laughs> um, so but it was great because I knew that when the kids came back, it was like they can actually touch that railing now and not gross out. So it was, um, it was good. We got a lot done. And I just have to um, hand it to the staff and the students at PV High. There were a lot. I, there was probably four students where I was, but then we got a tour of the buildings and through the hallways, and there was masses of students all over that campus doing landscaping projects, scrubbing walls, just real, and you could tell they really cared about their campus, um, and the staff uh, were paying out of their own pocket for cleaning supplies, and they're just so dedicated, so I was so happy to be able to see that. Um, the highlight of uh, my last couple of weeks was a groundbreaking that we had today at PVPSA's new property on Brewington and Eastlake Avenue. We are building a new behavioral health unit, which will be, or facility, I'm not going to say unit, that sounds institutional. Yeah, it's not a lockdown. Um, it's going to be a wonderful place for students and families to get counseling services, but it's also going to be open to the community uh, for use. It's going to be 6,300 square feet, and um, it was really nice to hear from the architect and the builder who um, the owners of those companies are both Watsonville High grads. So that was wonderful to hear from them. So um, just really, really, uh, really positive last couple of weeks. And um, I think that's about it for me. But anyway, thank you for letting me go on. There was lots, um, lots to do. And sorry, real quick before I go, um, the fair started today. It's going through Sunday. And PVUSD CTE programs are going to be highlighting career pathways um, at the fair as well as Watsonville High Health Careers Academy. They'll be in the Crescetti building, and then um, uh, PVUC will also be represented at Fiestas Patrias, right? Did I say that right? Um, in the city plaza on Sunday. So if you can get out to see any of our schools at those locations, that would be great. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, item 4.0 is approval of the agenda, and I do have one change that I noticed and I didn't get a chance to mention it. Um, this is, I think, governing board comments. It's uh, where in some spot here. It has um, on item three two. Um, it has our former student trustee Perla um, listed. We miss Perla, but um, uh, we'll have to just make that change for future board meetings and make sure that Rosalie is listed on there. So um, if someone would like to make... I'd like a, to make a motion to approve them, but I have a couple of um, corrections as well. Okay, could you include that correction that I just yes, mentioned? Yes, I will. Thank you. So I will include um, Trustee DeRose's correction on 3.2. Um, the correction that I had, one of them, on 3.4, and, and since they were my words, I'd like them to be, definitely be corrected. I remember how I said them. Um, when it was brought to the district administration's attention about the letter that was sent out with inappropriate or wrong um, trustees, I did not ask for apology to myself. I asked for it to be placed to the constituents who voted me in my area. So if you could remove herself from it. And so are you referring to the minutes? Point, the, 
for the, the agenda. The, I'm sorry. I'm We're not on the minutes. minutes. I'm sorry. I'm We're on agenda. You. So, but we'll we'll go back to that once okay. we get to that. Um, so, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll approve the agenda with motion. the amendment that you made to 3.2. Okay. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes 7-0. Uh, okay, item 5.1, this is approval of the minutes. So I'll pick that up. Um, I'll move to approve with the amendment to 3.4, which I previously stated I was not asking for an apology to myself, just to the constituents. And then on 8.6, when I mentioned the health course, um, that it be uniform and it, that it be a standardized curriculum, not that it be taught by the same person throughout the district. Okay, thank you. Are there any changes or would someone like to second that motion? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion passes 610 with Trustee DeSerpa opposing. And now we're at item six, uh, 6.1. Uh, visitor non-agenda items, public comment. So we do have one speaker, um, Beatriz Moreno. So this is a, this is a new clock, so it should be okay. set at three minutes. So if I mess it up. Okay, there we go. Uh, Be Virginia, if I may, she will be needing translation. Could you speak into the microphone? At 11.45. Could you speak in? Me llamo la secretaria de la escuela, la señora Mónica, para, para decirme que mi hija se había caído. No, no, pero no. Puede leerlo todo y luego yo lo leo en inglés. Ok, perfecto. ¿Está bien? Sí. Ok. Camila, Camila Moreno se había caído, pero estaba bien que fuera para recogerla para que la revisaran, ya que como mamá la conocía más, probablemente solo estaba asustada. Ella veía, um, solo estaba así. había hecho las pruebas de movilidad en sus brazos. La pregunta a mí, le pregunté a mi hija lo que había sucedido, ya que la secretaria Mónica solo, sea, solo sabía que se había caído. Por medio de mi hija fue que supe que estando en la barra una niña la empujó fuerte, perdió control, por lo cual cayó. Cuando cayó, los niños que estaban a su alrededor fueron quienes la levantaron y, le, y la llevaron y la acompañaron a la oficina. Me explicó que fue, que me explicó que fue muy duro caminar hacia la oficina. A ver, déjeme ir esta parte. Uh -huh. The secretary of the school called me from Watsonville Charter, uh, Miss Monica to tell me that my daughter Camila Moreno had fallen and but that she was fine um, she asked me to go pick her up and because uh, as her mother um, I would be able to know her better um, that probably uh, she was afraid she was scared uh, that but that they had moved her arm and every seemed everything seemed to be fine I asked my daughter to explain to me what had happened and the secretary um, or the secretary Monica only knew that she had fallen, but through my daughter, I found out that she had actually been uh, pushed off a bar and uh, she lost control and fell. When she fell, the children around her uh, were the ones that picked her up and they took her to the office. She explained to me that um, it was very hard for her to walk and her feet felt too fragile uh, and the same as her arms. El 23 de octubre fue a la, fue a la escuela para hacerle saber a la, la lesión de mi hija, la lesión de mi hija, al, Adriana Camila Moreno. Encontré la policía, la cual no había sido informada del accidente y al ver que preguntó a los, a los que estaban, no sabían, excepto la secretaria Mónica y la asistente, decidí hablar con la directora para principal. 
very low. Would you please apologize for me? I don't speak Spanish, but if you guys want to sit at that table and use one of those, are those mics working? It does, they're connected. They're con yeah. I'm so sorry. We're going to do better. Okay, my turn. On October the 23rd, 2017, I went to school to pick up my daughter's uh, homework, um, Adriana Camila Moreno. I encountered the principal, Miss Amy Thomas, and she informed me about the accident. Um, and, um, I, uh, and she had asked uh, what I knew uh, or what had uh, the Secretary Monica said to me. And I took the decision to speak directly to the principal um, at um, our Mr. Uh, Guillermo, um, Celila's uh, father, the child um, who accompanied or my child's friend, and she helped me to interpret. El 24, el 24 de, de octubre llamamos a la cita con la directora y con el fin de saber con el fin de saber si la principal Miss Thomas realmente estaba informada de lo sucedido y pedí una explicación de los siguientes puntos más importantes para mí. ¿Dónde estaban los adultos cuando sucedió? Ella me contestó que haría una junta con el personal para saber qué había pasado. A mí se me informó, se me informó la habían revisado y el día 23 que pedí el reporte, me dijeron que la señora, la señora Mónica, que no había hecho, que la señora Mónica no lo había hecho, que la enfermera que la revis, que el reviso, que la enfermera que la revisó no estaba. Entonces, yo quiero saber quién revisó a mi hija. Pedí copia del reporte a mis tomas, me dijo que tenía que corregir algunas cosas que no sabía cuál era el proceso, si podía darme la copia, que lo iba a hablar con su secretaria. On October the 24th, um, I met with Senor Guillermo, Mr. Guillermo, um, and also Miss um, Thomas, because um, I really wasn't informed as to what had happened, and I asked for an explanation um, because the following three points are important to me. I wanted to know where uh, the adults were when this happened. She answered that she would um, hold a meeting and ask the personnel uh, to see what had happened. And I was informed that, um, that they had checked her on the 23rd and I asked for a report from uh, Mrs. Monica. Uh, but she had not um, taken her to the nurse because the nurse was not there. And so I want to know uh, who checked my daughter. I asked for a copy of the report, and Miss Thomas said to me that they needed to make a few corrections, and she didn't know exactly what the process was. If she could give me a copy, she would speak with Secretary uh, Monica. 
El 6, de no, el 6 de noviembre hablé con la secretaria Mónica para pedirle copia del reporte. Me dijo que no podía darme, que ellos lo habían mandado y lo habían mandado al distrito, que si lo quería fuera a pedirlo. Fui a, y hablé con Ketty Fuentes, me interpretó Margarita Ponce, se me hizo saber que el reporte todavía no había sido recibido y que iban a hablar con su supervisora para ver si podían darme copia de ello y que me llamarían para hacerme saber. On November 6, 2017, I um, spoke with Monica uh, to ask for a copy of the report, and she told me that she was unable to give me that copy because um, it had because they had sent it to the district, and if I wanted a copy, I had to ask for it there. I went to the district and I spoke with Kathy Fuentes, and Margarita Ponce interpreted for me. She let me know that the report had not yet been received and uh, that they were going to speak with a supervisor so uh, to see if they could get me a copy and that they would call me to let me know. So, in this occasion, I agrego aquí no lo anoté, se fracturó sus dos manos. Y ahora vuelve a, el 20 de agosto del 2018. Para desgracia, mi hija sucede otra vez un accidente en el patio. Y mi hija cae lastimada, forma más grave y con riesgos en su crecimiento. El hueso de crecimiento en su codo se fracturó y quedó muy lesionado. A ver, pásame el número uno porque sé por qué había hecho la vez anterior. Ah, oh, ok. ¿Y se fracturó las dos manos? La vez primera, sí. Ahora solamente es la lesión. The first time my daughter fractured both hands. Uh, on August the 20th, 2018, um, she fell again in the patio. She hurt herself ve very gravely, and it uh, is going to interfere her growth. The, the um, growth bone in her elbow has been fractured, and it's uh, remained very affected. Lo que yo quiero, lo que yo he observado, En el área del patio no hay supervisión apropiada para los niños y niñas y esto para mí es una negligencia por parte de la escuela. En incidente, los niños llevan a los niños accidentados a la oficina por falta de adultos. El personal de la oficina no realiza un reporte acerca del incidente cuando llega el padre de familia, no se le da la información adecuada acerca de lo que pasó, ni le entregan el reporte. Yo lo pedí en la primera ocasión y ahora en la segunda y no se me ha entregado. Me pregunto si tendré que pedírselo a licencia del Estado o servicios sociales. Por favor, indíquenme quién entrega los reportes de los accidentes. Si se tiene una enfermera en la escuela, ¿por qué ella no...? ni siquiera les revisa ni, ni hace el reporte a los padres. What I have observed in the patio area, there is no adult supervision. Um, the children are left by themselves. And for me, that is very negligent on behalf of the school. In incidents like this, children, uh, children are the ones that take the other children uh, to the office for lack of an adult. The personnel at the office does not write up a report regarding the accident. Uh, when the parents come, um, they give them the inf they don't give them the adequate information regarding what happened. Um, they do not give them a report. I asked the first for the first on the first time and again on the second time for a report, um, but I, and I asked myself. Where do I have to go? Do I have to go to the state regarding this or social services? Please let me know what I need to do regarding the uh, uh, accident reports. If there is a nurse in school, why is it that she is not looking at the or checking the children and she does not even give a report to the parents or the family? Ms. Moreno, excuse me. Would you um, would you ask Ms. Moreno if she could um, forward her letter just because we've gone way over, but this board is very understanding of her concern, and our superintendent will direct our superintendent to follow up on this and report back to us, the board, and make sure that she is contacted right away 
uh, but we are interested in hearing the rest of um, her letter to the board. Okay, so if we can just, if we can wrap it up, but we do want to hear the conclusion. Thank you. Sí, eh, sí, ella quiere que le mande una o puede ir a la oficina, está bien, para darle una copia, porque a ellos les interesa mucho, les preocupa mucho su situación. Esta vez terminamos en Stanford, o sea, de emergencia. Sí, puede hablar con ella y ellas la van a atender. ¿Está bien? Sí. Ok. Okay. Pero alguien la va a atender. Okay. Thank you for coming. Okay, so we'll make sure that she's followed up with um, in a timely manner, for sure. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're at item seven, but there's no more speakers? No. Okay, thank you. Item um, 7.0, employee organization comments, and um, I'll call PVFT first, thank you. And I'm going to use my phone. This timer only goes to three minutes. You got it? Thank you. Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, there's a, a couple items that I just want to um, speak about. Uh, the first one is with regards to the uh, benefits and safety committees. Uh, both committees have met uh, already in the month of September, and I want to report that uh, it, the, uh, both uh, committees, I thought, went uh, well. It looks like we are on track to uh, fulfill uh, the contractual ob obligations um, from both the district and the union side on this, and so I want to thank um, our assistant superintendent of human resources, uh, Chona Colleen, and our CBO, uh, uh, Joe Dominguez, for uh, helping to uh, make sure that uh, the committees are uh, running straight and they're looking at all of the areas that need to be looked at. Uh, second, I also wanted to uh, speak a bit on item 8.6, the adult ed coordinator position. Uh, it is our understanding that at this time you are approving a job description uh, for this position, but uh, recru recruiting and filling this position uh, will be a, a separate decision or, or will take place rather at a later time. Um, that is our understanding. Um, and then third, I just want to um, comment a little bit on the unaudited actuals. Um, as uh, we will have uh, one of our members uh, give uh, more details on this, but uh, just in general, it looks like your ending fund balance uh, did go down from, uh, it looks uh, 57 million to 39 million. Um, and you know, that's um, money being used to educate students um, and make sure that uh, things are uh, running smoothly. I do wanna remind you that you do have an additional uh, 3% uh, reserve in addition to the required 3%, which goes uh, anywhere from 6.8 to $7 million uh, available there for you uh, to continue improving uh, teacher salaries and uh, working conditions, uh, as well as um, conditions for other employees in the district. So with that, uh, thank you, and we look forward to the uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone here from CSEA? No? Okay. Pavam? Uh, Hi there. Oh, 
Oh, yes, hello. And Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm Kathy Lathrop, Director of Early Childhood Education, representing FAVAM tonight. Um, and um, have uh, had a brief uh, discussion with um, Uli Kumaron, our president, and uh, she wants you all to know that school started well every place. And so she released me tonight to do a little bit of a, a call out to an air, a group of administrators in our district that I think are kind of a silent group. So I wanted to just bring to the attention of the board tonight that we have a long list of very valued coordinators in our district, 43 of them to be exact. And they range across programs. You see, you know about the principals of school sites, and you know about the directors who are here looking at you at each of the board meetings. And, um, but the coordinators are, I think, a very important management component of our district, and they're not that visible. Um, they range across different departments. A lot of those departments are doing direct service of students or support services of students. Of course, we have 17 site academic coordinators. We have eight after school program coordinators. We have five coordinators in the education department, 11 in the early childhood education department, some of them in child development, some of them in migrant seasonal head start, and one in student services, and it sounds like there may be one coming forward for adult ed. These folks often take the real specialized key functions of our departments and shepherd them, I'll say. I know Migrant Head Start has coordinators that do health and disabilities. We have coordinators that work on compliance, our teen parent program. Other, other directors, I'm sure, would represent the, the duties of those um, positions. So just a call out and an appreciation to that group of management tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I met one of the coordinators at PV High. So. Um, CWA, is there anybody here from CWA? No, okay, so that concludes item seven. Um, we'll move on to action items. And uh, the first one at, uh, is resolution 181910 for Latino Heritage Month, and this is a report by Lisa Aguirre, our Assistant Superintendent of Elementary. Good evening, President DeRose, Board of Trustees, um, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I am here tonight with two of the members from the Ethnic Studies Committee. Um, and before we read the resolution, I just wanted to, for those of you that are here, two years ago when we presented this, one of our um, staff members pointed out that a resolution is only as good as what we put on it and what we enact. And so I just want to say within the last two years, the Ethnic Studies Committee has done a lot of hard work to make sure that cultural celebrations and recognitions and honoring of the diverse community of PVSD happens and takes place throughout the year and not just the month of Latino Heritage Month that is celebrated throughout the nation. Um, so I'm proud to say within the two years, um, this is, as a student mentioned earlier, we have the Ethnic Studies English class that's now offered at all three comprehensive high schools. And then, um, which was a lot of hard work done by the Ethnic Studies Committee. And Mr. George Fellman, who I'll allow him to say a few words, um, worked with our coaches to infuse um, different um, um, cultural relevant curriculum into our elementary unit guides. And then also we have an annual um, art contest that celebrates the different diversity within our district um, that takes place during this month. And schools, elementary through high school, are celebrating this month and also Dia de la Independencia. Um, through different um, celebrations and honorings um, in all different ways. So I'm gonna let, go ahead and let George um, talk about um, what kind of what he, how he worked with the coaches and then Veronica is gonna actually do the resolution. Thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> so it's wonderful to be in front of you as things are going better, and I wanted to talk to you. We've got, we're working on a database. So the curriculum coaches are currently working to take several of the lessons that teachers are teaching in their classrooms, units that teachers are teaching in their classrooms, and draw attention to the parts of them that would support ethnic studies so that the teachers are able to pull those out. We're starting out with a brainstorm from the curriculum coaches and then going to be opening it up is the plan to open it up to the teachers to add to this database. 
And uh, also, I would love it if any of you are interested in coming by and reading a story to my students. Okay, I'm yours. You remember? Room five. Room five. Good evening, my name is Veronica Aguilar and I'm the principal of Alianza. So it's, rec it's recognizing September 15th through October 15th of 2018 as Latino Heritage Month. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District takes pride in joining citizens throughout the country in recognizing September 15th through October 15th, 2018 as National Latino Heritage Month. And whereas the forerunner of National Hispanic Heritage Month began in 1968 with a proclamation by President Lyndon B. Johnson as a week to celebrate Hispanic culture and recognize the important contributions that Latinos have made to this nation. And whereas Latinos represent an array of distinct and vibrant cultures, each of which enriches our community in valuable ways, and this serves as an opportunity to celebrate the group's heritage and culture. And whereas the term Latino refers to Mexico, Puerto Rico, South and Central America, or other Spanish cultures or origin, regardless of race, and according to the 2010 census, 50.5 million people, or 16% of the United States of America's population is of Hispanic origin. And whereas in 1988, the week expanded into Latino Heritage Month to commemorate, <laughs> commem sorry, commemorate, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't say that one, it's my second language that speaks. Through community activities, a more balanced and accurate picture of Latino history and is celebrated annually for a month starting September 15, as it coincides with the anniversary of the independence of five Latin American countries and Whereas the Pajaro Valley School District recognizes significant contributions and considerable advances that Latino Americans have made and continue to make in our community, state, and the world in areas such as education, medicine, art, culture, public service, economics, and development, politics, and human rights, we see the greatness of America in those who have risen above, the in above injustice and enriched our society. And Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District in its continued effort to honor Latino heritage during this month en enhance equality and diversity through art, literature, and celebrations of the diversity within the Latino community. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that at Pajaro Valley Unified School District proclaims September 15th through October 15th as Latino Heritage Month and is pleased to share the special annual tribute by learn inning and celebrating the generations of Hispanics who continue to, who have positively influenced and enriched our nation and society. Passed and adopted this 12th day of September 2018 in Watsonville, County of Santa Cruz, California. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I think it's a really important resolution um, for our community and our country and um, I'm wondering if it's actually more than 16%, so, um, which is, I, I don't know, I just, um, I think it's great, and I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to honor um, that community. So if somebody would like to make a motion or have comments before so, is there, are there speakers? Though? There isn't any speakers. Okay, thank you. But I would like to make the motion, and I also want to congratulate the Ethics Committee uh, for all the work that you've done, um, and I think, it's only gonna get better. Um, I think I would like to see ethnic studies across the district, not just in our comprehensive high schools, but we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was a motion. I'll That's second. A, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Of course not. The motion passes seven zero. Thank you and congratulations. So that will be on our website and in a press release. Is that what we're doing? Okay, great. Thank you, thank you for being here. Okay, and our next item is our unaudited actuals. Um, 
with our revised budget and multi-year proje projection. And our CBO, Joe Dominguez, will give this report. Good evening, uh, President DeRose, members of the board, uh, superintendent, members of the public. Um, this evening, we're going over our 2017-18 uh, unaudited actuals. And um, what that reflects is uh, we'll do an overview um, of our unaudited actuals, our multi-year summaries, and our next steps um, in the review. And so what is an unaudited actuals? It's an uh, annual report reflecting our final uh, revenues, expenditures, and ending fund balances. Um, we're required uh, by the state and our county to um, adhere to our budget cycle uh, within our fiscal year. And once uh, board approved, it's uh, submitted to the county for review and uh, final submission. Um, it summarizes in comparison from the previous fiscal year and revised current fiscal year. And, uh, and we will go through that for 17-18. Um, in our unrestricted comparison, just the point in time, I just want to clarify that it's 17-18, and it's from June to the closing of the books. Um, one thing that I was pleased about um, uh, as my first time in working with our director of fiscal, uh, with Helen, um, is I was very pleased to see that as an industry best practice, uh, when the, within the state, we look at variance. And uh, you look in the chart on the screen, you have your 1718 estimated actuals and then our 1718 unaudited actuals. And the third column is the variance uh, column. And best practices is trying to get that under 2%. And I'm proud to say that we have that with in between a half to 1% variance. Um, so that is within those guidelines. Um, some of the components is, um, is the revenue expenditures came in lower than anticipated, uh, and we will review that in the slides later uh, this evening. Um, but programs that are included in unrestricted are our classroom teachers, uh, most site and district admin, and benefits. Um, within the revenue side, it's our local, controlling, uh, <coughs> local control funding formula, and within our expenditures, it's our LCAP. Um, we reduced our fund balance uh, since estimated actuals by approximately $780,000. And um, I'd like to stress the point that uh, as a district, we are committed and it, it shows and reflects in, in this uh, document that we're spending today's funding, today's dollars on today's students. And we're putting those dollars to work. And so that's reflective in that. The next slide is our restricted. Uh, and as I stated before, similar within the variance, we're within 1% uh, uh, variance. Uh, so kudos to our fiscal team. Uh, revenue and expenditures did come in higher than anticipated. Um, and on the restricted side for um, this portion of the budget, it includes our federal uh, funds, Title I. Uh, state would be our California Clean Energy uh, Jobs Act. Uh, another state uh, portion is uh, special ed or SELPA. And then local would include such departments as like our site and athletic donations and our new teacher project. But as you can see there, you see the uh, estimated actual 1718, unaudited, and the variance. Our multi year. So for our multi year, what I'd like to point out is you see in our beginning balance. Um, from 57.58 uh, to 2021 to 21 uh, million and 58,000. And we are working, as I stated before, our uh, funding. The, through the outgoing years, uh, I also wanted to point out in the, the fifth uh, row down, the increase and decrease in fund balance. Uh, you see that we're using uh, our funds in place, but also that we have still a deficit spending, but I would like to commend the team that as a district, we're also reducing our deficit spending amount in our outgoing and our multi-year projection. One of the other components that um, I'd like to stress, but it's also uh, a concern, 
is that in 1920, we still maintain our 6% reserve, so the 3% uh, minimum, and then the board 3% um, on top of that for the 6%. But in 2021, the 6% reserve is reduced to 3% minimum. And I want to stress that point. Um, and then one of the other things um, I know we discussed in the multi-year um, does not include our negotiated um, outgoing settlements for negotiations, but it does capture up-to-date negotiated um, settlements with union leadership. Um, also another piece, it includes our current one-time funding from uh, the state and the governor. For, for outgoing years, we're unsure, so we don't want to put that on the books because it's unsure what one-time funding is going to be for the next year or the outgoing year. Um, one of the things that um, Helen and I also looked at and we had a, a good conversation and we have um, with the city of those have, have known there's a new housing development that was recently approved and those housing developments also um, for I think it's Sunrise um, development approximately 140 units that is not included in our multi-year and there's some projections of potential enrollment uh, that might bring to our district but that is probably three to four years down the road and then also that's not concrete of how much enrollment that would bring to our district. So that's not also included in our multi-year. Um, should we capture everything? Um, and so, uh, but just really wanted to, to stress the, um, the reserve being reduced in 2021. And um, we are also, we'll discuss later in the presentation of other further items that we're trying to enhance internal efficiencies and also reduce uh, deficit spending further. So. And I'll hand it off to Helen. Yes, but included in your board packet was um, the variance report. And so we want to just highlight a few of the items. Um, our LCFF revenue did come in um, lower than anticipated, and that was due to um, a prior year adjustment and adjust minor adjustments in the LCFF calculator. Uh, the STIRS on behalf is a required um, paper entry only on our books and we show it as a revenue um, and as an expense so it nets to zero but it does did increase our revenue um, on the report our grants are adjusted as we spend them so any grants that were spent um, in the current year that may have had some carryover into the following year we are there's certain types of grants that we can't reflect that entire revenue in the current year we have to defer it to the next year so those adjustments were made and um, we had a um, we have an agreement with the COE on the new teacher project that um, they'll reimburse us for part of the um, cost of the teachers that we have on loan to them and also for the um, program to um, train our teachers and so that did um, come in a little bit less than anticipated and we would, uh, we would like for grant funds to be like in the beginning of the fiscal year and wrap up at the end of the fiscal year. And sometimes that's not the case. Uh, we get grants throughout the fiscal year. And so we just make sure to, in the budget management process, that we work as a district for making sure that we spend those dollars accordingly and in a timely fashion. Okay, so on the expense side, Um, we had some adjustments. Um, our salaries certificated, the ret retro certificated came in a little bit higher than um, anticipated. Uh, we had on the classified side, there were extra work agreements that we had anticipated being used that weren't used. So those um, came in lower. We did have special ed aids come in a little bit higher than anticipated. And um, here's the stirs on behalf, the expense side. Um, we had anticipated maintenance to do a certain number of projects and they were able to get more done with by June 30th than we anticipated so those expenses um, supplies were, were higher and then we had some orders that were placed that we didn't receive in time um, and on those we are working on the procurement deadlines and processes to make sure that all orders placed are received in a timely manner and are reflected in the proper year and for, um, for facilities um, and on the maintenance side, it was actually um, 
a positive to see more work getting completed in uh, a certain time frame. And so we're uh, definitely kudos to our maintenance and facilities team to get the jobs done. And then between services and capital outlay, when we came, brought the estimated actuals to you, we anticipated the California Clean Energy projects to be paid out of um, services, uh, which is where they had been paid in prior years. Um, but they were actually capitalized projects, so it came out of, so it was just a variance between the two objects. And then MNO had a dying lawnmower, riding lawnmower that they had to replace. So that's reflected there. And we didn't anticipate that at so those adjustments are made, and then within the departments, you know, as uh, example is making sure we have functioning working equipment, um, and maybe as time, you know, points in time, things change or things break down, and so there's uh, justification behind that. So next steps is continuing to meet with the school site uh, leadership and department heads. Uh, we already have on the calendar uh, to meet with our directors for the week of October 22nd. And then principals are currently being scheduled and will fit within the next 45 days. Um, and the budget uh, management plan is making sure that we are in alignment with our allocations and we spend accordingly. We continue uh, spending today's dollars, today's funding on today's students. And most importantly, that we stay within budget. Uh, we want to continue enhancing our internal efficiencies. Um, I, we have a small list there, um, but I'd like to commend um, Katie, our Director for Transportation, um, we in the last three months have been working very hard on, and I know I've presented to the board about continue to work and enhance internal efficiencies, but for the first time in a while, in a long time, it's uh, transportation is actually projected to be flat um, and we have really put in place some enhancements in that and so I want to commend Katie for that and I know she'll be presenting to the board um, uh, at a later board meeting, TransFinder. But we're also looking at enhancing in our enrollment process, uh, working with our director, um, with Dan and, and Suzanne and CWA about an online process, but enhancing our parent packet. Um, also stressing the importance of our average daily attendance. And this evening we have um, uh, EduLink regarding our Saturday Academy, um, but also working with attention to attendance uh, at our principals and site leaders and then continuing the work that we're doing with SELPA in, in partnership with uh, Heather. So as we continue uh, making sure that we enhance uh, our internal efficiencies, uh, focus on the deficit spending and continue to reduce that, um, and our recommendation is to approve our unaudited actuals report as submitted, and um, I'm really um, proud to be under 1%. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have um, a speaker to this item, and once we hear from our speaker, we'll open it up to board comments and questions. Sean Henry. this up to. Um, my name is Sean Henry. I'm a school psychologist here. I'm very happy actually to come and, and have our um, contracts taken care of last year. Um, a lot of work with that. Um, I wanted to point out with the actuals is that one thing that's not really looked at is what did we actually spend in 1617 and what did we actually spend in 1718. Um, a lot of times what we're talking about are estimates. So last year in 1617 <coughs> we were it was estimated that we had a 19 uh, million, 19.5 million dollar um, deficit, and that was part of the reason why we couldn't get raises, and there was going to be a cap on our health benefits. And if you see, I just basically took these directly from um, the unaudited un actuals from last year and this year. So I actually have some copies for the board members if they want that as well. Last year we came in, we were mad because it was said we we're having a deficit, and that wasn't the case. Um, this year I'm glad that we finalized. Um, uh, our um, contracts, and so we are spending towards um, the, the workers here. And so something I want to point out is our total revenues increased by $3 million, but yet our total expenditures increased by $19.8 million. 
So when you talk about spending, you got to talk about the big three, the certificate of salaries, the classified salaries, and the employee benefits. Um, as you can see, we actually just spent $2.5 million more on all the certificated teachers, administrators, everybody that's in that category. Um, more on classified, partly because of raises for both, both units, but also um, minimum wage increase. So that, thankfully, uh, helped out our classified uh, brothers and sisters and employee benefits. But where did the other expenditures make up that $19 million more? Well, I took the other three, which is a slice of the pie, which is only about 15% of the pie. So we just talked about those, the supplies, the services, other operating outlets, and capital outlay. So when you look at those areas, we increased spending significantly in those areas. And actually, we increased a couple of those areas more in 17, 18 than we did that was actually spent on all the certi certificated salaries. So even though we did get a raise, I want to point that out, that the deficit this year is not teacher salaries. And so I hope the due diligence happens to find out exactly are those, are those other spending increases going to be ongoing because those will drain the end fund reserves just as much as the raises for the people that are working here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any board questions, comments, Maria? No? Who? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Jeff. Joe. Joe, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. This is the stuff that I kind of enjoy, so it tells you, well, tells you how interesting my, my social life is. Um, first, I want to congratulate you, and I want to congratulate uh, the entire district, your team, the district. We have been hammered by the union for years, and I understand why, saying you guys have these wild, wild swings between reports. Um, now we're at one, less than a 1% variance. That really does say, that really does show transparency, and it makes us more trustworthy. I want to thank you for that. that I know that was not easy to do. Um, you did the good work, and, it, and, it was, and thank you for it. So um, we had a member of the audience talk about some of the the one-time expenses that are some of the increase in expenses that we had in terms of capital outlay and so on and so forth. My understanding of that is, is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, we approved some, as a board, approved some purchases for textbooks, for um, desks, facilities, whatever it may be, that were one-time costs that directly affected our, directly affected this court, this budget. Am I correct? Correct. And, and one of the, um, the strong recommendations in, in my role and then our director of fiscal is to use, always use one-time funding for one-time costs and never to use one-time funding for ongoing costs. And so um, that's what we've implemented and the board um, uh, approved one-time expenditures on, on one-time funding for uh, supplies, for facility projects, for capital outlay projects, et cetera. So you're correct, yes. Uh, what did, um, well, you made, a, you made a statement about we're still deficit spending. So let's be clear. Great that we're less than 1% of the variance. That's fantastic. But we're spending more than we make. Correct, yes. So if there's no kids in, that in, in Sunshine Village or whatever that new village is, in a couple of years we're going to be, when I'm off the board, by the way, we're going to be spending, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, when I heard you say 19, or 2021, we were actually dropping below the 6%. Correct. The board is going to have to change its policy if we continue spending like we're spending. We also have a, you know, and I, I feel like I'm always the bearer of bad news, but it's only a matter of time before the next recession hits. Am I correct? Yes, you're correct. Okay. So I, you know, I, I really want to, I, I think it's been, again, great job. Thank you. But I don't think we can, I don't think we need to, I don't, I don't think it's time yet to say we're done. We still have a lot more work to do if we're going to continue to be, um, fiscally solvent. I was having a conversation today with uh, somebody and they said, you know, some districts are going through layoffs, some districts are really in trouble. I don't want us to be there in 2021. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and we do have some work to do. Um, and also included this evening, as I mentioned, is our average daily attendance. So it's focusing it, growing that uh, half percent. And so that's also a part of our attention to attendance partnership and uh, EduLink with uh, our Saturday Academy. 
Um, so definitely some work that we have to continue and be stringent on. Maria? Um, just to piggyback on what Jeff said, what, um, and to a comment that you made regarding the new developments coming into the city of Watsonville, so that's obviously going to increase our, uh, our enrollment. What strategies do we have in place to ensure that we're prepared to when that happens? And um, I know that we recently met with the city. What came about from that meeting? Um, is, are we going to be, uh, be building a partnership with them? Is the city of Watts Mill bringing additional revenue to the school district? It, it just seems like they're building these developments without really including us um, in their formula. So where do we stand with that? There's a, um, a couple, couple uh, components where uh, public school districts receive funding. So for new development, there are developer fees, and so that's a portion of funding that comes to school districts when there's development within a, a city uh, governance. And then the second is enrollment. And so th the reason that the development is not included in our multi-year is the developer for specific, that 140 unit, they were talking about a phased-in approach and that they're probably about four years out uh, before they um, get the shovels in the ground and get, I think, the first, I would say, 15 to 20 homes um, built in the first phase. Um, how to enhance the partnership uh, with the city, it's that collaborative uh, joint governmental uh, meeting that our superintendent led the efforts on, and really enhancing um, communication, but also uh, collaborative uh, between the intergovernment agencies about community development and community planning. Um, is making sure that we're strate strategically located uh, as a district and making sure we have our schools in the right location and what are the development of the city and how we complement each other. And I think that's where we really have some momentum and uh, can enhance that partnership. So do we know an estimate of how much developer fees, how many funding we can get out of that? Yes, we are doing our estimates uh, as we speak. We do have our current developer fee uh, rates and uh, we will provide that at a later uh, time to the board in our report. And we also have our end of year report for our devel developer fee um, projects and, and revenue that came from developer fees for the past year. Great. Thank you. But all that is all one time funding. Correct, Joe. So, so if those fees come in, they're, they're not ongoing, so we can't put those in, into the salary side. Those are for specific one-time funding for building schools. Correct. It's for enhancement, uh, modernization, or expansion of our school facilities. And it's, real, it's really to uh, support the district in incurring for enhancing enrollment at our sites. So, if, if I may. Joe, could you could you back up a little bit and, and go over the variances? What are the significance of the variances? So, so the variances are based on the budget of the past year and how we're spending it this year, I guess, right? Correct. And what the difference is, so that we are living within our budget. Um, is that is that about right? So um, as I commented before, our budget is a living document and it's reflective of point in time. And um, for example, the May revise and the governor uh, signs legislation, it's enacted. Uh, we take that, we implement using our, um, it's a statewide it's the school services calculator that we say, okay, what does that legislation mean in regards to funding and how we plug that into our, our uh, district budgets that is um, taken into effect and we budget as looking at past expenditures and revenues and we do estimated estimations on both revenue and expenditures. Then a point in time as this evening, we provide a variance or uh, compare that to unaudited actual. So what was budgeted and then later down the year, what was actual. Right. The variance okay. reflects how close we are to what we um, estimated back in a point in time when, Correct. for example, the May revise. Okay, so so when I'm out there and uh, people ask me, well, why why did we not have a higher salary increase? 
what I what I see on the report, if you look at the estimated in actuals, if if we had spent more than what we had budgeted, we would be in, really in the negative. Correct. Correct. And and so that variance would be much higher, which Correct. means that we're going to be negative uh, sooner. Right? Is that? That is correct. So, so right now we're just with our current um, estimates and our actuals, the third year out, I'm already going to have to dip lower than the 6% reserve. So anything above and beyond that, if we were to spend more now, the, the time frame would have come, would be a lot sooner. Right. So that my, my uh, point is that if we, we had a higher salary increase is what the union wanted, that would that would put us way over the revenue income and we would be in a deeper negative is that right correct yes so 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 that because we were only one percent below the the estimated we were we were pretty solid in terms of this is the max that we that we could offer and keep us solvent basically correct I right. think we were very diligently uh, working with School Services of California and our internal fiscal team and uh, getting within that 1% um, really shows that anything more, uh, what that impact could have been uh, for the district. Right. So, so basically we, uh, we were able to keep the health, the, um, the uh, fringe benefit <coughs> packet, which is probably the one of the best around, pay for that, and also a, a slight salary increase, and uh, still be balanced. Is that correct? So we were able to maintain uh, our benefit package, and we are in the the top three uh, within the region, uh, and then also maintain uh, our three percent reserve, um, and maintain fiscal solvency. But I am concerned about the third year out because we have to dip below the six. Right. Um, <coughs> I would like, uh, commend our superintendent and our team uh, as a district because we are using today's dollars, today's funding on today's students. So you see the ending fund balance decreasing, but that is because it's strategic and we're investing those dollars now. Um, but I do have some caution for the third year out. The the uh, the uh, COE has has a final say over our budget, and they actually look now and also out to the third year. Correct. Correct. Yes, they do. So 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 if they see the same numbers that we have, which which obviously they will, then isn't that going to put our budget in negative uh, standings or? We uh, we have a, we have the review and or. Uh, a very thorough review by the county and um, and then that goes up uh, eventually to the state uh, the California <coughs> Department of Education but at the county level it's reviewed um, we have to show um, our cash flow and making sure that we have cash on hand to meet our expenditures uh, throughout our fiscal cycle and then making sure that we meet our three percent reserve and so they do analysis of that um, they I think for the upcoming the unknowns because we, we can't really uh, look at the fiscal uh, glass and kind of see what's coming around the corner but I can also say that they will look at our multi-year and the third year out and making sure that we have a plan in place to maintain the three percent reserve. Thank you. You're Hi. So I do have a question about, well, a few questions. So we, what I heard in a prior um, board presentation is that we're spending about 91% of our, our full budget on, um, on staff, on salaries and benefits Correct. and retirement. Is that 91% today or is that 91% at the end of the third year? It is actually 91% approximately it's a little bit higher today and that and includes that's the package of salary and benefits combined okay and our LCFF um, funding is now flat right we're not going to be getting any more 
Correct. Supposedly. Yes, we are fully funded in our uh, LCFS. Okay. And what is the guidance from the state about how much of our budget, like what is the benchmark about how much of our budget should be set, spent on people in terms of a percentage? Is it, because I had heard it was around 86%. We were above that. We were, I think we were at 87. Now we're at 91. Do you, do you happen to know what the guidance is from the state around how much of our budget, there, like a healthy school district should be spending on people? There is a, a range that is recommended, and it's from 80% up to 86%. Right. Um, and that's the range that the, the state has provided. Um, each district is different, and given their current um, local and how they use their local funding um, and how that's offset with the local, um, I would say, community, um, but that varies. But that's the range that we're given. Okay. One of the things I heard the speaker say is that we were – we had a deficit. We never had a deficit. We had an ending fund balance for the past several years. But we are deficit spending. We're, we're spending more money each year than we're actually getting in revenue. Correct. Correct. Okay. We, are, we, are, we do have a deficit. Um, for 18-19, it's approximately $10 million. For 19-20, it's $8.3 million. And for 2021, we got it down to 5.9. But that's also with reducing the six percent reserve down to three percent. So that's the one, that leads me to my next question that I have. So we, as a board, voted to put an additional three percent into that ending fund balance. I'm guessing in order for you to use that three percent to pay for expenses ongoing, you'll also need the board's permission to do that. And that is so. The answer is yes. And the in this within the multi-year, and we'll come back at the funding cycle, but within this, it shows the 6% being reduced to 3% in 2021. Yeah, I see that, 3.13. I sort of was under the impression that the extra 3% wasn't going to be used for ongoing, that it was going to be used sort of as a literally a rainy day fund if the state ever um, couldn't make their obligations to us, which has happened before, recently. I would like to commend the board for having the 6% reserve. And this is, I guess, um, this is the rainy day in 2021 where I have to use it. Okay, unless other revenue can be got. Okay. Correct. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Helen. Trustee Ursino. Joe, how long would three percent pay our salaries? Back of the back of the envelope. So I'm, we're. We're, we're thinking about three weeks, approximately. So if we have 3% or, or 6%, 6% six six is only six weeks. Correct. So I just want to make that very clear. Uh, you know, I, I think as people campaign as, and as the public hears, well, they have 6%, and, and the 6% figure on two and, and 250 million is what, 18 million? No, no, no. Six, no, 18 million or so? Okay, that's six weeks of salaries. That, that, I think that's we need to keep them in the back of our head, especially as you talk about dropping below that. Uh, there was a, the former CFO um, who used to stand in your sit at your desk, I guess, used to say, "All a rainy day fund does is buy you time. Six percent buys us six weeks." Correct. It's is that six, correct? It's about six weeks of, of payroll. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Issue, but. I mean, knowing about it. But I mean, the state is like making all these great assumptions that they have this big rainy day fund in the state now that they've never had before, that now they do. They do. do we know about that? I mean, you know, what's happening? I mean, is, it, is that big, huge rainy day fund still available at the state level? <laughs> it, it is uh, the governor in his May revise actually increased additional funding to the rainy day fund for the state. Um, and so within his last year, he, is, he has built up the rainy day fund significantly for the state. Um, the unknown for districts in California is, are there going to be additional one-time funds in the outgoing years? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that, that's why I mentioned that's not included in our multi-year. Right. And so um, but that is yet to be, to be seen. But you're talking about, one-time funds, you're not talking about ongoing, yeah? Correct. Uh-huh. Here, your mic. 
You had another question. I just have a couple more comments. Um, I'm almost feeling like we need to add an additional staff of grant writers, plural, <laughs> so that we can actually go after. I mean, I don't, I, she's done such a great job, but I think there's just money on the table that's still out there that we could really be getting to do something to help. I mean, I guess what I'm concerned about is we have, you know, under this budget that we currently have, we're having to already implement a lot of belt tightening, because I know when you say we're looking to the internally to, how did you phrase it? Efficiency. Eternal efficiencies. What that really means is belt tightening. I was very dismayed to see that we had canceled some professional development for our science teachers or they couldn't meet together because we, because of the budget. And I thought, oh my God. It was in the, it was in the B2B on Friday. No, that wasn't the. No, uh, you have to read Rob Hoffman's comments. So, um, Anyway, so, uh, so I know what that means, internal efficiencies, is that everybody needs to be very, very cautious and some things are gonna go un unmanaged, undone. What I really, of course, worry about are our facilities, as you know, like we're, you know, we've made some progress, there's still so much to do. Um, I, I'm hoping that the union joins us potentially in looking at, A, going out for another bond, or pot potentially a parcel tax. We have, um, you know, neighbors all over this county that can't even make their budgets because of they don't get as much money as our district because they don't have the population that we have. But um, for services, for facilities, for our music and art programs, for our science programs, I, I just don't want to stop our forward momentum because we're belt tightening. So that, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay. So um, the 80 to 86 percent recommended um, on people I had heard that as well and I know I'm and this board knows and I think everybody um, knows about the high cost of living in our area um, and 80 to 86 percent would be obviously far less than what we're spending now and it's really hard to make ends meet in this area because we're you know we're all in the same boat unfortunately our funding is not calculated on the cost of living on where we are geographically I would love to see that changed because I think it's just um, it's really unfair it's unfair to our teachers to our staff and and our students because if our if everyone's stressed out because they can't pay their bills students are going to feel that so in the big picture in the long term I'd like to I would like it if the unions um, worked with us and started to um, hope for some change, work for some change. But currently, right now, that's not the case. So um, we do have to be careful. Um, I do also commend your office as well as the superintendent on really just stripping that budget down to zero and going through it line by line and finding the savings that we were able to find um, some were were mistakes we're gonna admit that but others were you know we really don't have to budget for this position that hasn't been there for five years it's not going to be there um, because of that hard work and the diligence that you did um, is why we we're able to give um, increase what our, our offer was and end up settling on something that um, uh, we were comfortable with and would keep us running but we do still have the deficit spending and we're not flush, but um, I, I'm expecting we're going to keep being diligent about the budget every every line by line, so we can continue to get better, hopefully. And really, I do think that we need to um, use our positions as board members, administrators in the union to start talking about a change in the way our calculations are. Because it's not going to, I don't see it getting any better. Santa Cruz County is not going to get less expensive than, you know, Merced or uh, whatever. It's going to get worse, and um, it has it has to change so we can be fair. So, um, are there any other comments or questions from the board? Yes. Okay. If not, I will entertain a motion to pass the unaudited actuals. I uh, so move, and with the comment, I'm, I uh, second your uh, thanks to uh, to everybody, Superintendent Joe, um, Helen. Helen, you haven't said anything tonight. Would you like to? <laughs> 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 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I feel that, that the uh, budget is really solid um, and um, right on, and I just want to thank you guys for doing a great job keeping us there. Thanks. Thanks for your mm -hmm. right here. And yes. And was that a second from Trustee Ursino? Yes. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes 610 with Trustee Acosta opposing. Okay, our next item, 8.3, is um, request to approve educational consulting services contract. And this is um, a report by, again, CBO Joe Dominguez. All right, so this evening, I'm pleased to present our uh, extending our Saturday Academy, our uh, academic attendance recovery uh, uh, program district wide. And we have Edgy Link and uh, Representative uh, Chris, come on up. Uh, and we'll just give a, a brief overview of the program and um, kind of recap as a district what we've accomplished and how we look uh, like as we move forward. And so one of the internal efficiencies is increasing our um, attendance recovery. And so we'll outline that uh, this evening and we'll also take questions. So I'm gonna hand it over to Chris provide the uh, presentation. Thank you, Joe. All right, uh, good evening, um, board members, uh, President DeRose and Superintendent uh, Rodriguez. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, my name is Chris Gokey, and uh, we work with school districts up and down the state um, ranging from Sacramento to Napa to Monterey to uh, Santa Ana. And uh, last year, uh, we were privileged to positively engage 375,000 students on Saturday, um, recovering 260,000 absences for just under $20 million for school districts. And Pajaro Valley Unified School District is um, included in those numbers. I'll uh, just give you a, a quick overview of uh, the program and then talk about um, where we would like to go with it. So really when we're talking about attendance, um, we ask three questions. And do I need to click or do I need to? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you for your work over there. So we really ask three questions. What are we doing um, Monday through Friday, uh, weekend and week out, month in and month out to promote attendance? And it's everything from September Awareness, Attendance Awareness Month, to um, communications out to our families and our community about the importance of coming to school every single day. Uh, we also ask the question on what we're doing to increase our attendance. And then uh, finally, we ask the question, uh, what are we doing to recover uh, lost ADA from students who miss? Are we going to, uh, to coordinate our, our efforts here? All right. <laughs> this one. Okay, so uh, really the opportunity is um, when we answer those questions, uh, no matter what we do Monday through Friday, students are going to miss. And if we look at our attendance numbers here in Pajaro Valley, and we look at them throughout the state, um, oftentimes when we think of attendance, we, our, our mind goes to chronic absenteeism students that are missing 10% uh, or more of school. Um, and, and there's three buckets. There's the perfect attendance, there's the chronic absenteeism, and then there's the margin in the middle. The majority of lost ADA comes from students who are sick, comes from students who uh, maybe their parents take them out of school because uh, we're going to Disneyland and we want to get there when uh, it's less busy uh, during the week. And so um, revenue's lost every day. Um, mostly because of the excused and the unexcused absences. Education code does allow us to re-engage those students and recover that lost ADA, and there's only one way to do it, uh, through weekend classes. We can't do it before school, we can't do it after school, we can't do it during spring break, there's only one way. And, and so our job is to rebrand the Saturday experience, uh, changing it from when I went to school, when it was the breakfast club, uh, to uh, to engaging in a meaningful instructional day. Uh, the program has been highlighted in uh, 
a couple of reports, including uh, she was then uh, Attorney General Kamala Harris, now Senator Kamala Harris, talking about a best practice in student engagement and attendance. Um, and we know that students benefit from extended learning opportunities. We know that teachers and sites benefit from building deeper relationships with their students. And we also uh, know that uh, teachers appreciate uh, flexibility for instruction. Thank you. So when we rebrand Saturday and make it an inviting and uh, exciting, engaging uh, half day, these, this is what Saturday is, is supposed to look like and, and our goals for, for the district. So programs can range from uh, Footsteps to Brilliance, English language development. You have really incredible VAPA programs here in the district, um, social emotional learning, sports, enrichment, and um, STEAM. Uh, the strategy is to create an experience that teachers would want to teach in and students would want to attend so that uh, we're able to attract as many students who had an absence during the week that we can uh, to help recover that revenue that, um, that we lost. So um, the program has been uh, running well, and uh, we've been doing a good job, and we have a vision to do a great job. Uh, over the past three years, uh, each year, uh, we've grown in terms of the number of students that we've been engaging, starting out with 2015-16, uh, uh, we had 10,000 students throughout the district that voluntarily came in on Saturday uh, to receive uh, lost instruction or enrichment. Um, the totals for the past three years, uh, we've uh, positively engaged about 34,000 students and recovered about 21,000 absences uh, for just about $1.1 million. Uh, the current attendance rates for the district hover right around 95.5%, uh, and, and um, the board and the leadership team has set a goal uh, to get to 96.3%. And so uh, what we're looking to do is we're looking to grow the Saturday program with a few strategies. Uh, align uh, Saturdays with uh, attendance goals being really intentional about managing attendance rates um, with a uh, fair amount of frequency um, and talking to district uh, leadership at the site on what their uh, current attendance rates are and how we can improve those uh, month in and month out. And then align Saturday Academy with any academic goals that you have uh, to increase language development or additional VAPA or, or whatever those look like. Um, a big opportunity for us is to uh, strongly encourage all sites to participate. Uh, over the past uh, three years, we've been operating at about 27% of our capacity uh, relative to other districts of your like size and demographic throughout the state. And uh, we would love to get to about 50% of capacity, which would be double the numbers that, that we saw um, by recovering about 15,000 absences in one year. And I think that will um, uh, really help us uh, get to that 96.3% that we're shooting for. Um, we want to expand staffing options. Uh, this is a voluntary program for both students and teachers. And so some sites have um, uh, a, a nice pool of teachers to pull from and to engage students. And some sites, we're still trying to recruit teachers to do that. So um, uh, some of the staffing strategies could include uh, teachers from other sites, helping sites that don't have enough teachers, uh, even calling upon uh, substitutes that are very qualified and offer engaging uh, instruction to help staff it appropriately. And, um, and then we want to share uh, a portion of the net revenue um, to the sites that are participating fully uh, to help them uh, help us recover the revenue. So we would be uh, uh, netting out all the costs. Uh, the, the vast majority of the costs are, are the teachers and uh, custodians, uh, safety assistants, and things like that. After we net out all the costs, we would share a portion of the net revenue uh, back to the sites to encourage them uh, to really play full out with the program with us. So with that, um, that is an overview of where we've been and where we would like to go. And I'm certainly open to uh, any questions that you have about the program. Thank you. Do we have any speakers? None. None, okay. And question, Karen? 
Just for fun, um, just in terms of like getting more people to do it, could you perhaps, would there be a possibility to even ask substitutes? Because they might, I don't know, substitutes might have some kind of thing that they could, they had really great that they could teach students. Um, could we maybe even engage substitutes for the Saturday classes? A absolutely, that's a strategy that we wanted to deploy moving forward for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, substitutes come uh, sometimes with really creative and great ideas. As a matter of fact, um, before I uh, arrived here tonight, I just came from a meeting in Fresno Unified, and, and we were talking about substitutes arriving, um, and, and they had a passion for um, uh, making movies and, and, and technology. And so uh, the, the, those substitutes come prepared. They come uh, ready to engage the students with uh, sometimes uh, creative ideas that, that may not be uh, being deployed Monday through Friday already. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. And, um, and they would make a little tiny bit of extra money as well, I mean, doing Saturday. I mean, because, you know, substitutes are always looking for ways to get in there so they can make a little bit of money. <laughs> I agree with you, yes. <laughs> yeah. OK, thanks. OK. Maria, like whoever's light goes on first, that's how I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So just looking at the statistics of um, students who attended prior years, um, that's only about 50% of our student population. So um, out of all those, for example, in 1718, we had 12,812 students attend. Out of those, how many were from elementary schools and how many were middle and high school? I appreciate the question. Um, the, the program has, uh, has seen success at uh, both the elementary level and the uh, secondary level. The majority of students that do attend uh, come from the secondary level, only because the legacy program that was here before we started this was primarily at the, um, the secondary level because they have um, attendance requirements to go to things like prom and graduate and, and all of that. Um, when we started the program, we rebranded it, and we rebranded the experience from uh, a punitive uh, makeup to, uh, yeah, uh, to, to a positive uh, engaging. And so we would really like to see that um, across the board. And so I think we do have a good opportunity in the elementary level, although the elementaries that have been participating have, have been doing a great job. And so um, w what's nice is that, uh, you know, when we look at attendance, uh, sometimes we think of it as a secondary issue as well. but the, the research shows that K-3 um, does have uh, the majority of absences throughout the state. And so, and what's cool about that demographic is that they generally enjoy still coming to school. So, um, so when, when yeah, once you get them there and, and, and so uh, you just create the space for them and, and, and the forum to engage them in a positive way. And then they start asking about coming back to school on Sunday and things like that too. So, right. um, yeah. um, you didn't mention this is volunteer. Um, so do we have any incentives in place that we are currently exploring to ensure that more teachers participate, not just uh, recreating substitutes? Yeah, so the, the, the teachers um, do are compensated um, for, um, for, for uh, participating on Saturday. And, and the reason why it's voluntary is in the code it actually says that you have mm -hmm. to invite them uh, to come. The only way that you can mandate them to come is if they are truant. So it's a voluntary program for the students voluntary extra work for the teachers. Um, that's the reason why we had the net distribution uh, at 40% back to the sites is the, the vision is if we're able to partner with the sites to recapture the ADA with us, they can use some of that 40% mm -hmm. to reinvest back into the program okay. or to the teachers. So yeah, we were intentional about that. And one of the other uh, adjustments with the 40% is the 40% was held on to the end of the year and then given in a lump check to the site, back to the school site. So this year we're actually, to kind of incentivize the sites, we're gonna break the 40% uh, in quarterly payments. So the site will get it in the current year uh, every three months. That's so wonderful. So it really puts us out of Okay. Um, and I know I had one last question here. Come back to me. <laughs> I need to find it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what about Sunday activities? Why is it only on Saturday? We, we, we work with, a, uh, uh, I think it's pushing about 800 school sites up and down the states. And, and we do have some districts that, that uh, operate on Sundays. Uh, the vast majority are Saturdays. Um, it, it is a possibility, but I, I think. Okay. Yeah. 
What if we have a uh, soccer league that uh, plays on a Sunday? And that yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, how how Ed Code is written is, if you're preparing for a performance, if you're receiving instruction and you're practicing, that would be eligible to recover the lost instruction that was missed. If you're doing the performance, then um, uh, that would not. So if you're playing the game, we would not recover. If we're practicing and learning how to play the game, then we would be able to recover. Okay. So um, what about a high school sports team, football, and if they had a practice on a Saturday, would all those? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Would all count? Yes, it would. And, and, and we, we encourage uh, the sports teams who, in a lot of cases, uh, come back uh, sometimes anyway. And so if they come back for maybe they're doing some um, uh, weightlifting or, 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 or some practice, uh, blending that with instruction. So you may have one or two hours of practice, two or three hours of some academics. Um, my home district in Visalia Unified, uh, one of their football teams um, had uh, 10 players that were academically ineligible and, and actually used the Saturday Academy to improve their academics to become eligible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I like your yeah. strategy. Okay. So I when a, when a uh, teacher yeah. works, uh, works in this program, it, I'm sorry, does the, um, does the um, payroll count towards S to SDRS or any, any of those uh, um, pension plans, et cetera? Um, we, we do calculate both uh, salary and benefit contributions in the cost of the teacher. If a if if a um, uh, if a, a school wanted a um, with an a, a all weather track and a synthetic field, so it so it so it doesn't matter where they use this money to for. Uh, you're you're correct. It does come back to the district in the base funding. Right. Okay. And what's really uh, a strategy worth considering is that you can invest some supplemental and concentration dollars in the program and recover base funding for it. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, I do have a couple more questions. So just to piggyback on some of Willie's comments, so what about summer? I wish, but no. It's not possible? Yeah. We can only, uh, yeah, that would be really cool, but um, we can only recover any all-day absences from the first day of school till P2. Okay. Only within the school year. That's really unfortunate. I know. It really is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank <I know>. you. <laughs> You're welcome. And you may have covered Jeff. this, but the the approximate I'm sorry, Leslie. Jeff. The approximate cost is eighty five hundred for professional development for teachers. Yes, sir. And then eight dollars per student yes, sir. on Saturday, right? Yes, sir. Okay. What did it cost us last year, do you know? Uh, I would have to look. I think um, I would have to get that number for you. I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't have it with. But I saw a figure of 1.2 million for three years. Yeah. So and, that and we think took in extra. Yeah. So uh, generally, we try to run at about a 50 percent uh, cost to revenue ratio. Okay. So if you recover a million bucks, all the costs, including our support services, would be about half that. Okay. So out of that 1.2 million, did we make 1.2 million, or did we make 600,000? 600. Okay. So we recovered 1.2. Out of that 1.1, I'm sorry, if we recovered 1.1, um, out of that top line revenue come the cost of the teachers, come the cost of the custodians, come the cost of any support fees, and the district netted six, okay. about. So you didn't, you guys, didn't, you didn't make 600,000 personally. I mean, Correct. not your company. It would have right. been okay. Yeah, we actually paid for ourselves okay. uh, in the revenue that we recover. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I? I just want to um, a little bit more. Hang on, just a second. Uh, with what Jeff was saying. So I was looking at the contract, and it looks like um, you charge $8 per student plus $8,500 for a one-year contract. Uh, the, the contract is, uh, uh, the one that we've put before you is, so since people change and compliance matters, we have the $8,500 to refresh the program every single year, mm -hmm. making sure all the teachers and the sites and the leads know what the rules are. Um, strategies on, on how to optimize the program. And then after that cost, that's really the only hard cost, 8,500. We only make money if you make money. Okay. So, so. we, and then um, uh, it, the, the, the contract before you is a three-year contract, but we okay. put a 30-day clause in there where you can cancel at any time. Okay. So 
in doing that math, I came up with, um, and in the coming year, if we did, if we had 15,000 kids, um, it would would cost the district 128,500. And if, then if you figure, I'm just going to go low, the 1.1 million, which it would be higher than that because it's 3,000 more kids, um, would be. Um, at least 374,000 as a profit to this district. I don't want to say profit. We're not not a profit. Recovered. That's correct, yeah. Right. And out of that would be the staff um, staff costs and the programmatic costs. So um, each day, uh, conservatively, uh, if, if we wanted to use school services as the reference for an average daily uh, value, mm -hmm. is um, anywhere between about $55 to $75, uh, broken out by LCFF. So the, the little kiddos are worth $55, and, and the, the high school kids uh, were, were funded based upon $75. So if, you, if we want to recover 15000 then if we wanted to be conservative, I would multiply 15000 times uh, 55, mm -hmm. and that's how you would get the top line. And then you would multiply 15000 times the 8, uh, is what it would cost us. Um, we would net out teachers, and so uh, 15,000 times, if we wanted to do 55, um, carry the one, <laughs> uh, it's 825,000. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, uh, again, we would operate at about that 50% margin where we would look to try to uh, net 400,000 plus. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's at a conservative 55. Okay, so, um, so on the contract, I'm um, Assuming the dates aren't on here yet because you didn't know when it was coming to the board, right? And you just fill in because I just noticed there's no dates on here. Uh, but it does says 18 to 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so when would this contract begin if we approve it? Uh, sites are giving us a call. So whenever you guys give us the green light, we're ready. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just make sure the dates are filled in. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and no, hold on just a second. Kim had questions first and then you can go. Hi, thanks for coming. So um, our former assistant superintendent, Mark Brewer, brought this program uh, here to our district. He had been using it in his former district, and so we thank him for that. Um, so this is a great way to get kids, you know, enriched, remediated, et cetera, re re and then recover ADA. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, can directors or people who are in administration actually come back into the classroom and do any of the teaching if they're not actual classroom teachers, if uh, they wanted to? Uh, the answer would, would be determined based upon your district leadership and, and the HR policies. Mm -hmm. um, from my position, uh, how we look at it is when, so the model is that uh, principals don't have to be there on Saturday. We identify a lead. Um, it's worth considering where um, that lead position could be uh, anybody. Um, the, the teachers that are providing direct instruction have to be credentialed, but um, if the lead wanted to be a different job class and whatever that um, uh, allocation for uh, the, the, the pay rate for that individual, uh, if they've met those requirements, then uh, yes, okay. anybody could. I just think that I think people who have oftentimes promoted into administrative positions, yeah. I think, miss the classroom, and I just thought it'd be an extra way, I hear a great that a lot. way for them to make money. I hear that a lot, yeah. And share their talents and expertise with kids. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we give a percentage to the site, and that that's determined by the district, our district, yes, ma'am, administration, not by your guys's recommendation, but that it's a strategy to get people to partner. How, how many campuses did we have this um, program active in? Campuses yeah, because yeah, some schools couldn't generate enough little, interest. A little bit more than half, yeah. Okay, so half. Yeah. Okay. So do we have a strategy to roll this out into all every school in our district, or what's the strategy? Uh, yes. I, I think uh, a, a combination of the uh, strategies that we listed here along with uh, additional guidance from the district leadership, I think we can uh, roll it out to all uh, sites um, okay. and, you know, recalibrate as we go uh, if, if we're uh, uh, trying to, to find enough staff uh, for Saturdays. But, uh, yeah, in order to reach the 15,000, uh, we would, we would want to have all sites participating. So how about... 
Go ahead. Can I continue yeah, course. along with yeah. that? So if, let's say, uh, Watsonville High School does not participate, but there's students there who want to participate, and the program's very successful with great staffing at PB High. Mm -hmm. Could students from Watsonville High attend one of the course offerings um, at a different school site and they still get funding for it? They could. Um, how it would shake out is where the student attends Monday through Friday, that site would get the credit for the ADA uh, recovered. And, um, you know, oftentimes when, when I'm sitting with, with uh, uh, colleagues like yourself or, or with district leadership, um, sometimes we talk about some hub models where we try to host all of the students in one particular hub uh, for a number of different reasons, sometimes cost, sometimes those types of things. But what we find is that uh, when all sites participate, it really, um, the program reaches its full potential because kids feel um, comfortable going to mm -hmm. the site that they go to Monday through Friday for the most part. Parents feel comfortable taking their students right. to uh, the same site that they go through Monday through Friday. And so that's why uh, we, we strongly uh, recommend and try to pursue every single site uh, participating. Right. And I think that should be an option if yeah. possible. But in the case that, for whatever reason, yeah. It doesn't happen. That is mm -hmm. an, an option that we have. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, Kim. That's okay. So um, I'm a mom of a high school student, and um, one of the things that would have really helped her is having um, an enriched, like, SAT, ACT prep, which I've been, we've been talking about, but we haven't really reached, reached that, um, that goal yet. Um, so I think that would be really helpful to not just my kid, but to every kid in the district, because we don't do so well sometimes on that standardized testing. And so I'm hopeful that we could pu push that into the Saturday school. Um, can kids get any like counseling support during Saturday school, or be in a group like a mental health group? Uh, we're seeing we're seeing quite a bit of social emotional um, uh, sound decision making, um, positive self talk, those types of okay. things. Working on yeah. character development. So, okay, question. So we used to have um, a very innovative um, way to discipline kids instead of expelling them or not expelling them, suspending them. We did in-house suspensions with the curriculum and uh, mentors on campus, and that seems to have gone away. I don't even know. I didn't know it went away until I asked about it recently. Is, is that something that could happen on Saturdays for in-house suspension kids? Um, the, the only absence that we cannot recover is suspension. Okay. So thank whether, you. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So I just want to ask, so um, if you're working with every site leadership, maybe principals or whatever in every site, they figure out, for example, they had 20 absences, I'm just making this up, obviously 20 absences in the month or whatever. <laughs> um, so and in every site figuring out how many absences they have, every single site, is, it, no, it can say to you, for example, I don't know how many absences they had. You know what I'm saying? That we would actually know exactly how many absences. Then, then how is it, for example, would you, you know, because obviously some of the students or the parents, in some cases, don't even know about the Saturday classes. I mean, they didn't even know that they don't even know they exist because, you know, their life is, you know, whatever. Um, so how would it be that we, can work with each of those students where there's absences so that they and their parents, for example, would know about these Saturday classes, how would be able to tell every student that's absent in every single site, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that every single student is aware that they can go to these Saturday classes and that there's gonna be fun things to do and you know, they're, they're, you know they can be, you know, they can go to do all these great things, whether they be sports or art or SAT, whatever. <laughs> um, that, you know, that they have those opportunities. And so how would every single student everywhere that's absent know that they can do this? <laughs> Good question. It's a multi-pronged approach. So uh, uh, through our, our, our team and the communications department, which I think uh, we're really making some great progress here as a district in our communications front, so uh, branding the program and marketing the program in the right way. 
Um, we're also really intentional about sending personalized invitations. We pull from eSchools Plus, a list of students that have one or more absences, and we personally invite them uh, to the student. At the elementary level, um, uh, the, the forms actually make it home, which is really cool. At the secondary level, uh, sometimes they don't, so it's a little bit uh, different approach to recruit the secondary students. But um, yeah, we certainly are intentional about knowing how many absences are on the table and then going after those. Going after those students. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Each of those students. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Georgia. Uh, yes, my question is actually for Joe. Um, could you elaborate for me why is it that we're having to contract out for this service and we're not able to handle it in house? I think it's a it's a combination of, of things. One is internal capacity. Um, they have the expertise and been successful in other districts to increase the attendance recovery. Um, there are um, very few districts that it, it becomes internal staffing um, and uh, internal capacity to roll the program out. Um, we had a combination, from my understanding, last year. Uh, it was also district staff that did um, from our registrar to our uh, input of the attendance component piece of it. Um, and then that ended up becoming a, an internal challenge. Um, and Chris has, and his firm has the resources, and so they ended up doing the data entry and doing some cleanup. Um, so there's, uh, it's not just one thing, but I think it's a, it's a combination of things. Um, I think maybe down the road we can look at what does it look like to build that internal capacity and in, in as a district. Um, we're not there yet, um, but we are trying to implement best practices. Um, as Chris mentioned, at 27%, um, capacity there is definitely a lot of room to grow um, and if we can increase that to, to 50 percent and really work with site leadership and our um, with our assistant superintendents with Lisa and Susan and then also Suzanne and our child welfare and attendance uh, office I think we could really make a uh, humongous strides but it's it's really internal capacity and um, the specialty that they have and you said they've already come through the data, so that means we've already contracted with them without a contract? Previous. We've been so there, there are previous contract uh, that was approved. So okay. they've, this isn't their, uh, they accomplished this last year. Okay. And the prior year. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, Willie. Okay. Thank you. Um, just to, um, just to um, make, make sure that this is a, this is the, way that I understood it was um, that if a child, if a, a student has 100% attendance and comes to a Saturday event, he's actually creating credit for someone who may have cut. Yeah, that's a good question. So when, when you look at the numbers, you'll, you'll notice that uh, you know, the, the number of students that attended in 15, 16 were over 10,000, the number of absences that were recovered, thank you were uh, about 7,000. So there are students that are coming for, um, maybe they're AP students and they right. have zero absences, or maybe they're studying for the SAT or something like that. Um, what we find is that the amount that's recovered um, uh, allows that margin to be acceptable and still profitable. In addition, uh, you'll, you'll, you know that a lot of students are social. So if Joe and I are friends, but I'm the worst one and I have a lot of absences, but both of us come, Joe has zero absences, it's still all good because the, the amount that they would recover for, for one absence um, will, will, will help pay for all of the costs. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Yep. So um, just in, in closing, Karen, I like your idea about the subs. Um, I think that's a great idea, but I would want to see preference for our teachers first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but that's a great idea. Um, and there's professional development that comes with this for them, is that correct? So um, I think part of the reason why we even started working with the district was we wanted to make sure that the program was in compliance, and so that's one of the reasons why we were brought in. And so the professional development uh, really focuses on compliance plus best practices to reach the program potential. So uh, we, we will train all of the, the sites and all of the leads. Um, sometimes that's centralized, sometimes we go site to site and do uh, individual trainings. but. Um, yes, professional development is important because people change in the district. Okay, so that really follows just for the board. We um, hire outside consultants for professional development um, all the time. Yeah. So this really is no different. This is, um, this is past practice. This is 
how we provide professional development opportunities for our students and it happens to benefit kids and the district budget too so great thank you so much and thank you for answering all the questions You're welcome. <clears throat> so I'm Happy gonna um, ask for a motion to approve this contract motion, motion. to approve I'll second <coughs> sorry I'm getting hoarse um, all those in favor aye. aye aye any opposed excellent motion passes 7-0 thank you <clears throat> I have water thank you <clears throat> okay um, item 8.4 is resolution 18-1906 um, recognizing California week of the school administrator and this is a report by Dr. Colleen. Yes, thank you President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, California school communities honor educational leaders during the week of the school administrator. This year um, it will be observed starting on my birthday, October 8th, um, through October 14th. Highlights of the resolution include um, school administrators are passionate, lifelong learners who believe in the value of quality public education and providing quality service for students um, is paramount to the profession. Most school administrators began their careers as teachers and the average administrator served in public education for more than a decade. Public schools operate with lean management systems. School leaders depend on a network of support from school communities, board, um, trustees, administrators, uh, teachers, parents, students, businesses, community members, colleges, um, and different organizations. And research shows that um, great schools are led by great principals and great districts are led by great superintendents. Uh, the site leaders are supported by extensive administrative networks throughout the state and the future of California's public education system depends upon the quality of its leadership. And um, be it resolved by, by the Governing Board of the Pajaro Valley Unified School Districts that all school leaders be commended for the contributions they make to successful student achievement. Great. Do we have speakers to this item? None. Okay, great. Um, any comments, questions from the board? Kim? And Is then Maria. Just piggybacking, I think um, I'd like to thank all of you sitting up here who um, work really hard every day to make sure that we have excellence in our district and to all the directors sitting here looking at us, thank you for sitting through some of these very long grueling meetings and thank you for all the work you're doing with the people that are directly reporting to you. Um, we're moving the district finally in the right direction and I, all, I think all of us up here, or almost all of us are very pleased with the direction that we're going. So I commend you, I thank you, please thank your principals and your coordinators. Uh, I just want to make a motion to approve this item. I also want to thank our administrators for your contributions to our PBSU community and commitment to our students. Okay. A second? Okay. So I just wanted to say um, uh, one of the things that I've really en enjoyed seeing over the last couple of years is the increase um, on the focus of our professional development and creating opportunities for our um, employees to um, rise up into higher positions. And again, that's that professional development piece um, and mentoring that I think has been, uh, it's something that the board has always liked to see, but I'm really pleased that um, it's happening more and there's more of an emphasis on it. And I just think that that creates um, a stronger school community uh, from district office all the way throughout and um, more mentorship from our staff and our teachers who elevate in their positions, then now they're in, in a position to mentor uh, those still at the site. So I think it creates a cycle that's really positive. So anyway, um, um, congratulations and I'm happy to call for a vote on this resolution. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes, resolution passes 7-0. Thank you so much. Okay, item 8.5, um, this is uh, a report also by Dr. Colleen um, to approve an appointment of teachers on preliminary internship permits. 
Yes, thank you, uh, President DeRose. There's still a significant shortage of teachers nationwide, although our district team have assertively engaged in a myriad of um, recruitment activities, shortages for appropriately credentialed teachers still exist. And similar to other districts, we are submitting for review and approval by our governing board of trustees applications for provisional interim permits to meet our teacher needs. Um, we're requesting four um, PIPs um, for the following four individuals, and all will be getting a site teacher mentor, thanks to our board approval of the mentor um, agreement with um, Pajaro Valley uh, Federation of Teachers. And the four teachers that we're requesting this for is Abigail Andrade. Um, she um, received her degree from CSU Stanislaus as an English major, and she will be teaching uh, transitional kindergarten at Amesti. Uh, Liliana Avlech Sanchez, uh, she received her degree from CSUMB li in liberal studies, and she'll be working on intervention, reading intervention at Ohlone. Uh, Denise Hernandez, um, from, she received her uh, degree uh, from CSUMB. Uh, liberal studies, and she'll be working um, at Calabasas in the first grade uh, with the first grade team. And Jessica Perlman, who received her uh, degree from Mitchell College, and that's in Connecticut, um, and in psychology, and she'll be working with um, our autis autism team at H.J. Hyde. And sharing data from information requested from our board members, um, beginning with Vice President uh, Orozco. Um, due to early, more aggressive recruitment efforts, we did reduce the needs for these teaching permits. Last year, we requested 25 short-term teaching permits. This year, it's down to 11. Um, provisional intern permits are around five or six uh, for both years. 10 of the 60 candidates uh, from last year, which includes intern along with the permit candidates, uh, received their credentials uh, thanks um, in part to the diligence of our site administrators, their staff, and especially the site teacher um, mentors. And again, thanks to the board for approving the mentor agreement with PVFT. Okay, thank you. Do we have any speakers? None. None. And any comments or questions, Maria? Do you have? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, and um, real quick before I call for the vote, I just want to say also not only growing our own, but really <laughs> growing our own. I just um, noticed that we do have a lot of students who graduate from our school district and they come back as teachers. One of them was my daughter's best friend in junior high. Uh -huh. So I'm really excited about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so we have a motion and a second, so I'll go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent M uh, motion, or is this a resolution? Appointment passes 7-0. Um, before we move on to the next one, I need to ask for an amendment to the agenda. So whoever motioned and seconded, if we remember, if um, uh, there was a mistake on the agenda, item 9-2 is a resolution and should have been under action items. So I'd like to ask that we amend the agenda and move 9-2 to after 8.8. .8. So Ava, can you look back and see who motioned and seconded on the agenda approval? Okay, so sure. you made the motion, Georgia. Are you willing to um, amend your motion and Kim uh, amend your second? Okay, that was a yes. Is that sufficient? Um, I think it's all about right. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure it was a. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks. Motion passes 7 0. Okay. Item 8.6, this is approval of job description for a coordinator for adult education. And I'm assuming this is Dr. Colleen again. Yes, it Again. Is. <laughs> uh, thank you, President DeRose. Uh, due to the expansion of the adult education incorporating programs in Santa Cruz and the additional adult education block grant requirements, an additional administrator is needed. And this position is going to be fully covered by adult education funds. Um, tonight, we are requesting board approval of just the job description. 
Um, we will be holding off on recruitment as um, indicated by uh, PVFT President Francisco Rodriguez until there is a memorandum of understanding um, is, that is agreed upon with PVFT to ensure that teacher rights uh, regarding assignments and placements in the newly ratified and approved uh, collective bargaining agreement or contract are clearly clarified to all the teachers and duly adhered to. And Dr. Um, B is here to help us with any questions regarding administrations for the position. No speakers. Okay, no speakers. Um, are there any, any questions or comments from the board? I mean, I think at one point we didn't approve. Oh, is it speaking on? Yeah, it's on. I think at one point we didn't approve it. And, you know, I do agree that, you know, we are expanding our adult education quite a bit. And there's a lot that's happening in, in the Santa Cruz area now in terms of adult education. And I remember even Nancy was talking about we might even expand into San Lorenzo Valley or something. Woo! <laughs> um, so I do agree that, you know, eventually after we do this job description, we need to look at a position like this um, for our adult education, you know, because it's expanded quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's no other discussion. Do you want to make the motion? Or do you I'll make a motion that we pass this job description. I'll second. Okay. And then do you have a comment? No? Me? Okay. Nancy, do you want to comment at all on this position? Just that I'm, I'm very glad that it's here. Um, we've had this uh, merger for, four year, for three years. We're starting our fourth year. We've added probably about 20 teachers, 24 teachers. We have over 1,000 students in the Santa Cruz area, and we would greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Great. Great. Thousand students too, so so um, all those in favor of passing this job description? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Motion passes 7 Thank zero. Thank you very much. Great. Happy to support. Okay. And um, this is um, our next item, 8.7, is the approval of job description for assistant superintendent of secondary, Dr. Colleen. Yes, thank you, President DeRose. Um, there exists a vacancy for the Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. When originally recruited for, the job was for an Assistant Superintendent in a zone. Um, for board consideration, we develop a new job description which better reflects the responsibilities uh, for this position in providing leadership in the development and coordination of our programs at the secondary level. And we need to pass the job description before we can recruit for a, 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 an assistant superintendent of secondary education. I, I, um, I propose that we pass this. <laughs> okay. Somebody can talk if they want to. <laughs> so, um, second. A motion, we need a second, and then there may be comments. A second. Okay. And comment? Maria, um, and then Georgia. Sure. Then so, Lily. so, reading the job description. Um, I think it is very important that our assistant superintendent of secondary education has experience as a high school principal. And under the job description, that's listed as a preferred requirement versus a requirement. And so I'm wondering why that why we made the decision. Um, I'll go ahead and speak to that. So one thing also that's in the job description is the fact that we want them to also have current district administration experience, so um, have been either a director or currently an assistant superintendent of secondary. There are several, and there's no one specifically in mind, but there are several candidates out there that possibly were only an intermediate principal that are currently doing um, secondary level work at the district level. Um, as the director of secondary or an assistant superintendent of secondary, and we don't want to weed out um, anyone that could possibly be a great candidate. So I do think um, that it definitely is, is preferable, um, but the most important thing actually for me is that they have district level experience um, because, and 
it is my own bias, but um, be, working at the district level is very different than working at the site level. Um, and so at the site level, you are kind of the king of the ship, right? And then you work with everyone that's around you. Um, and at the district level, every decision that you make affects everyone that is around you. Um, and so I want them to understand that and to know that. And so there they can also direct um, directors and coordinators effectively as well. Okay. Yes, um, next is Georgia, and then Willie, and then Karen. Um, Shana, I just, it seems very clear to me and that this is just job description, but just for um, clarif public clarification, this is just job description. There's nothing about any changes to the previous contract at this point. So no uh -huh. proposals of changes to the, what the previous secondary assistant soup had in contract to what you'd be looking at to this new hire at this point. Trustee Acosta, what we're looking at is a job description and then we will follow that with a recruitment and there is a contract that needs to be signed which will be submitted to the board for your consideration at a later time once right. we are able to get a candidate. And as I said, that seems clear to me, but just for clarification, then the answer to my question is yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we uh, have that position now. Um, what is the difference between the the uh, job description of the position now versus this change? Why, why do we have to make this change? Right. So when we went to go recruit, um, we didn't actually have a job description for an assistant superintendent of secondary. Um, when we looked at um, what um, Mr. Brewer is brought in at, it was a zone superintendent. Um, and so when you looked at the job description, it didn't accurately describe what the, an assistant superintendent of secondary does. Mm -hmm. Also, there is some complication with STRS um, that we don't want to get any of our employees in. Um, and so we want to make sure that there is actually a job description for the job title that they hold. And currently, there is none. Mm, and wow. so we needed to do it to clean up um, the situation. Just follow up to that, which is just really quick. Um, so that's concerning to me. Um, and so, did we look at the current job descriptions that we have for um, Lisa's position? We do have. Okay, and that's set in stone. Okay. So I'm going to follow up on that also. Sorry. So what happened was years back we had zone superintendents. We had a north zone, a central zone, and a south zone. And all of those assistant superintendents' contracts were identical, I believe, in their responsibilities because they were aligned. They each had um, elementaries, middle schools, and high schools. So all of those job descriptions were the same. It's not that there wasn't a contract with a job description. Right. It wasn't a job description describing his actual job that he was doing now that they, we don't have zones anymore. When we, so does that clarify things a little bit? Because uh, I know there's public that may not know when that. When we uh, changed from the zones mm -hmm. to secondary elementary, uh -huh. we, we didn't have time to to uh, write a new job description. I would think that's the, that's where we are Why now. We, or it just wasn't done. Maybe right. not that we didn't have time. OK, Karen, go ahead. No, well, I, I really don't have that any questions, actually. But I mean, why do we end up with a job description for Lisa? Why do, why do we have one for her? I mean, just, just, and not one for him. I mean, I was just interested in this. Um, <laughs> I wasn't present during that time, yeah, so exactly. I don't know. Exactly. I, um, <laughs> I will say that when I first was told that we didn't have one, I didn't believe staff. <laughs> and I said that that, could, that cannot be possible. Um, and um, we uh, investigated, and in fact, we had one for every other assistant superintendent, but we did not have one for an assistant superintendent of secondary. That's too funny. I mean, to be honest with you, it's kind of funny. Okay. <laughs> Did you have a comment, Ken? So, so, Dr. Rodriguez, do you feel that this um, job description casts the widest net possible to bring exceptional talent to our district? I do. It's not too restrictive. 
No, that's exactly why we did not put in um, high school required. Thank you. So with that, I'll go ahead and I'll, I will ask for a motion. I did that earlier. Oh, you did. And we have, that's right. Thank you. So um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. 6-0-1. Oh, Jeff, thank you. Um, motion passes 601. Trustee, you're seeing up, um, away from the seat. Um, okay, 8.8 .8 is our next item, and that is an approval of the 2018 through 2021 student teaching agreement with uh, UCSC and Dr. Colleen. It's my last one, and it's the one I'm most excited about. I hope you're excited about it too. Um, anyways, for your consideration um, is the contract with UC Santa Cruz to continue our student teacher program. Um, past practice has been to facilitate these agreements for student teaching as it allows the districts to identify and recruit highly skilled candidates before they reach the general marketplace. And the, the district continues to contract with a number of local universities, which includes um, the UC system, the Cal State system, San Jose State, and a variety of different private universities um, to get our student teachers. Um, we're pleased to announce that this year we have former student teachers um, that have joined our PBUSD family as teachers, um, regular classroom teachers in the classroom. Most notably were um, science and English teachers who were being heavily recruited at a job fair, including by us. Um, me and a principal were running around trying to get them to sign a conditional agreement with a district. Um, but in the end, they chose us um, because they fell in love with our students in our district. No more speakers, right? No speakers. Okay, so um, well, we have uh, Maria. Well, I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, and is there a second? Second. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so all those in favor? Oh, but I was I was going to comment. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, I was just interested. I mean, I saw all the schools. I think I'm allowed to say this on this one because we're talking about UCSB. You talk about all these other schools. I'm, I'm just interested why we wouldn't have higher level schools. I mean, UC Santa Cruz is the highest level school you have on there because there's no one, there's no other UC systems, nothing on there. So I was just wondering why we don't have other schools like UC Berkeley, even maybe Stanford. They have you know, you know, in, you know, teachers coming from those kind of high level schools, because we have Chico State, whatever they have. I, I forgot what the ones, I mean, I read all the ones you had, Bethany, Bethany School, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I was just wondering why we're not trying to get, you know, work with places like that, UC Berkeley, you know, Sa San Diego <laughs> State, I mean, Stanford, whatever. Just, let's, let's give them <laughs> UCLA. UCLA, not UCLA. Yeah, UCLA. Oh, UCLA. Uh, There's we, another one. UCLA. We, yeah, UCLA. Um, that's a that's UCLA. a great UCLA. question. UCLA. Um, any any place but USC. Um, that is a great question. We are um, sorry, Dr. Rodriguez. We are working on expanding that. Um, we're reaching out to more colleges because, um, especially with the quality of student teachers that we you know like there was a science. I mean, he was phenomenal. Um, as a student teacher, and um, uh, me and um, uh, Lane Legoretta actually chased them around um, Cal State um, Monterey for Monterey Bay during their job fair because everybody wanted to recruit him. So we want to expand these programs um, because we know that it's better to grow from within, and you know, and we're seeing a lot of that as um, you know, we're getting our student teachers to become teachers. And um, we're working with PVFT with mentors and, and, and helping um, people out. We're getting classified employees moving into the teaching ranks and um, principals moving up to district levels. So it, it is really exciting to see. And we will be expanding the colleges that um, we're looking to work with. Um, this is a great question, you know, and, and this was one that um, you know, Trustee DeSerpa brings up several times, and so we will, we are working on expanding. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. I think Dr. Rodriguez has a comment and then Willie. Yeah, so, so just one note is with student teachers, the only challenge of going significantly outside of the area is the fact that they would have to get themselves to the area. So for instance, most people that are student that are going to college in Berkeley um, would probably find it challenging to travel and traverse so far here, right? Yeah. Not at no, that 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 is accurate. But what what it is is that a lot of times they have a partnership with a fellow district, and so I just wanted to mention. And I know that Dr. Clean will will work hard to fulfill your request, but I did want to mention that it does require them to be able to go to be in multiple locations. So meaning they, a lot of times, especially their first um, semester, have both classes and um, student teaching. And so that would require them to be able to be very agile. Sometimes there's um, online programs and then there's also satellite programs that allow it to happen. So nothing is impossible and I've said that before. Um, but I did want to mention that um, because it is an obstacle that I just wanted the board to be aware of that, that is a challenge. Okay, Willie. Okay, Willie. Yes, my uh, Karen, my uh, daughter went to UC Irvine for her uh, BA degree, and then she went to uh, Cal State LA for her teaching credential because there are there are some schools that are better, uh, stronger as teaching type of of uh, schools. And um, my old school, Fresno, uh, Fresno State, was excellent. That's what we're noted for, so, kind of. But, but San Jose State was one of the first teaching colleges, colleges just to develop teachers. So I don't think I would go to Harvard if I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. And so it's not, you know, you have to look at that part of it. And what I, what I like about the, uh, <laughs> the um, thing here that, that that's on the agenda is the is the fact that we're authorizing HR to be able to sign up qualified really outstanding people right away and it's that speed to get in there and grab people that are outstanding without having to come to the board first and go through that that's the same procedure that, uh, that the board authorized HR to do uh, several years ago for uh, standard teachers. Okay, so I um, recommend that we um, get, this, get this thing going. So that's my motion to approve. Okay. Um, if there's a second, and I see Jeff has a comment. Oh, no, no, I was, I was, I was just going to say, I'll second, by the way. I was just going to say, Karen, I'm married to a Chico State graduate, so we will talk later. And my my brother is a SC graduate, so Chona, we'll talk later, too. Um, no, I will proudly second this. Okay. Actually, there was already a motion and a second. Okay. It was Maria and Kim. Apparently, I'm getting tired. So I'm going to go ahead and call for a vote. Um, all those in favor of approving this item? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. So, um, motion passes 7-0. Um, we're on to item 9. This is report and discussion items. And item 9.1 is safe routes to schools report. We, we moved no, up 9.2. 9.2. Oh, 9.2. Okay, thank you. Uh, 9.2, resolution 18-1907, indemnification of the city for PV High athletic field and this is by Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah. So thank you very much. So on um, so we on Friday May 11th of this past school year um, the appeal period for the athletic field closed and there was no appeals or objections and one of the stipulations of the permit with the city of Watsonville was that we approved that indemnification resolution within 90 days which we did do. Um, that occurred on May 23rd. Um, during, since that time, we have gone through the additional settlement items. So we've done three key items. We completed the navigation easement, the escrow account control 
um, agreement and also the deed restriction, all things that were required from the settlement. During the negotiation of those three things with the um, with the city of Watsonville, there has been some additional revisions that were requested. It's actually very um, not um, not challenging um, verbiage, but some changes that were requested from the indemnification so that they could sign off on all components. And so what we're asking for is that you approve um, the revised resolution so that we can continue on to the next board meeting um, with the approval of the project and then moving it forward. This is just this, at this point, this is just about the revised mm -hmm. indemnification. And it was due to just some wordsmithing that occurred as we were approving the other three item. I need a, okay. I do need approval on this, yes. Uh -huh. Is there a second? second. Okay, and is there any? Comments? There's no speakers. Any comments or? The, the uh, comment that I'll make is, is that it, because, because there was no objections or no appeals filed, there's that, that uh, probably limits the exposure as to the. Yeah, there, there is no legal remedy for people that did not um, do it before the, before the time period. So that's why we did wait until that window closed. Um, because it's my obligation for you guys to keep you out of peril. And so there is no ability for us, there's no legal, um, there's no legal um, justification for anyone to sue us unless we do not follow through with the settlement in which we are following through on. Okay. Okay. I'd like to make the motion to approve. Second. Oh, you already did? Pardon me, I'm sorry. So you said the second. Okay. So that's your second, because you seconded. Okay, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. So one more step closer to getting PVI finished. So yay. Yeah. Thank you. Now item 9.1, Safe Routes to Schools report. And Dr. Rodriguez? Amelia. Yeah. So Amelia, you can go ahead and come on up. Would you like so to introduce her? Amelia is, um, she works for, she's the planner for Ecology Action, and she is here today to do a presentation for you all to keep you abreast of what is happening um, and what will be happening at our sites. Um, we want to make sure that the board is aware so when public engages you, um, you're aware of um, what will be happening. And so thank you for being here, Amelia, and thank you for waiting. Trustees, thanks for making space on your agenda for me. My name is Amelia Conlin, and I'm a planner with Ecology Action, and I'm here to talk with you about a Safe Routes to Schools planning effort that we're beginning now. Uh, oh, perfect. So this project is funded through a Caltrans planning grant through the state of California. Um, and some funding for this actually came from SB1, the gas, ta gas tax funds. Move that a little yes, okay. certainly, how's that? Yeah. Okay. And we have a great project team working on this project, including the city of Watsonville, the county of Santa Cruz, uh, the county of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency, and Pajaro Valley Unified School District. And I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and appreciate the long partnership between Ecology Action and the district. Ecology Action is a nonprofit that's based in Santa Cruz, and we started working with the district back in 2005, bringing the biannual Bike to Work Day and Bike to School Day program to district schools. Um, and since, um, since 2005, we've been bringing the Bike Smart and Walk Smart programs to the district, and these are youth bike safety education programs that teach second and fifth graders how to walk and bike safely. Um, so we appreciate the long-standing partnership. Mm -hmm. So for this planning process, the result will be a Safe Routes to Schools plan that includes a comprehensive list of the barriers to students walking and biking to school. Um, and my apologies, that should actually be 21 PVUSD schools within the city of Watsonville, Aptos, and Rio Del Mar. 
And this plan will also include a list of recommendations to improve safe access to school. And these recommendations will both be infrastructure recommendations, such as improved crosswalks, sidewalks, bike facilities, things of that nature, as well as non-infrastructure recommendations, such as improvements to school circulation patterns, as well as parent and school education programs. And the big goal here is to help the city of Watsonville and the county of Santa Cruz to bring in grant funding. Um, so the state of California really likes to see that cities have done this type of planning work. Um, we'll have a prioritized project list that's based on the cost of projects, based on how many comments we receive from parents, um, and based on crash data around schools. And that will allow us to choose the most important projects and for the city and the county to go after grant funding to get these projects built. And this project was based off a project that the city of Santa Cruz completed in 2013. Uh, and following completion of their Safe Routes to School plan, they received $1.4 in grant funding from the Active Transportation Program to complete a variety of improvements around Santa Cruz City Schools. So that's really the goal here is to get pub public input on where the problems are, come up with a project list of solutions, and then bring in the funding to get those projects built. So the first stage, you're going to get dizzy watching that PowerPoint. The first stage of the project are two public meetings that are coming up on September 26th and 27th in Watsonville. And we actually have a third meeting on October 10th in Aptos, uh, serving schools in Aptos and Rio Del Mar. And we are trying to get broad participation from parents at these meetings. And we'll be asking parents to tell us what are the areas around each school that feel unsafe. Where is there a crosswalk, where there's some tricky interactions with drivers, where are their kids riding their bikes on a dirt path instead of a sidewalk? What are all the issues that we need to be addressing in this plan? So we really want to encourage people to come out to this. And following the public meetings, we'll be holding walking audits at each of the schools. And this is a meeting of school stakeholders, including parents, school administrators, neighbors, and public work staff uh, who will be observing the school drop-off period in the morning and taking a deeper look at how traffic is flowing, how students biking and walking are interacting with drivers, um, and what are the issues that need to be addressed. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, and an overview of the project timeline. Again, we have public meetings coming up on September 26th and 27th in Watsonville, and then October 10th in Aptos. And then following the public meetings, we'll have walking audits in October and November. We'll be going back to each school in the spring for a presentation of our project recommendations to make sure that we're on the right track, that we have the right project list, um, and that it's a good fit for the school community. And then we'll be coming back to present the final plan to school district um, and city councils in early 2020. So my big ask here tonight we would love to have all of you involved in this process. Um, we'd love to see you at a public meeting and would definitely appreciate any help spreading the word to your parent and teacher communities. Um, public input is really key to us. Having a comprehensive list of the issues that need to be addressed and then working to find the right set of solutions. So would welcome any opportunities to spread the word. I've got a stack of flyers that I'll leave behind. And again, thanks, and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much. Um, Willie, you look like you're ready. And then Jeff. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Um, you know that if you want to see a wonderful example of access, you have to go to Aptos High School, where they really did a great job. And it was uh, championed by um, Trustee Kim. And, um, and, 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 and I have to tell you honestly, when I thought we were going to do that, I, th I thought she was, you know, exaggerating on me a little bit. But it was a fact that safety and the approach to the school, everything was right, Kim. So, you know, you have to look at some of those successful projects, access and everything that, uh, that, that I think is outstanding. What is really needed right now, number one project, I think, is a second, secondary access to PV High School. We had, we had looked at that. We had, we had it planned out, but it was, was going to cost like a million-something dollars. 
And if you can come up with a grant like that, I'm with you. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Okay. Um, Amelia, I got called to a meeting um, by super, supervisor or friend um, where some of the I mean, sidewalks, I guess, really curbs in front of Rio Del Mar School have been overtaken by trees. So tree, people planted pine trees 50 years ago. Now the streets in front of the school are terrible, are in very bad shape. Um, and so, is that something you're going to be addressing? Because, as much as I want to help the students, that's really not school property. That's the private. Uh, that's the person who owns the homes. Mm -hmm. the so, is that something that you would look at and something you'd consider fixing? Yep, absolutely. The bulk of the issues that we'll be looking at will be outside of school property, so generally in the public right of way, and we will be looking at uh, recommendations to improve. So then I would recommend you invite um, Supervisor Friend to the meeting, the Aptos meeting on October 10th. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think he'd be very interested um, in looking at this and making some suggestions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I want to piggyback on that. I think that's a great idea. You may have already thought of it, but a lot of our school sites sit outside of city limits. Uh, so I think county supervisors would be, um, it would be really good to have, have them there. Um, will you also be looking at traffic flow? Because I, and I have, I'm asking for a specific question. There's, um, well, one, I'm sure there's more than one, but the one intersection I go through every morning near PV High, um, it's really, really dangerous because drivers aren't aware of what the actual rules of the road are. And I almost see car on car accidents, car on pedestrian accidents every single day. And it's on yielding on a green, on a left turn. And so I talked to the city engineer about it actually at our intergovernmental affairs meeting and um, let, her, let her know that, but I was wondering, is that something that you would look at? Would it expand that far? Yep, absolutely, and some of the recommend recommendations could be around parent education. We're actually doing a similar project in Marina and Seaside right now, and we're seeing some best practices in terms of distributing information through the PTA at the beginning of the school year on how traffic flow should operate and things that parents should be looking out for. So yes, that is definitely something we'll be considering and, and looking for ways to improve. Mm. this project so um, I I will um, ask for a motion okay, oh report and discussion that's right well I wanted to you know, <laughs> thank you about, thank you very much thank and you. again thanks for staying so late I appreciate yeah. it okay so uh, we're on to the consent agenda and um, someone would like to make a motion to approve Is there something you want to pull? Yeah, I think it's a migrant head start. What is it? Is it mindfulness? No. Migrant preschool swimming program? Okay, I'm not so sure. Okay, what number is that, Karen? That's, um, 7. Okay, do you want to make a motion to approve and defer that item? Okay, can you do that? Okay, is there a second? A second. Um, I do have, um, and I don't know how how to go about it. Um, without having to pull all these items. So there is multiple. You can do a second and then you can comment. And then I can on comment them. on that, okay. As long as it's not like, if you wanna ask questions and have a discussion. No, you I just want a clarification. Well, no, no, she's not asking to pull it. She just wants to make a comment on them. So we uh, can no, do a clarification. that. Well, well, that's, I think you need to defer. I need to, yeah, because okay. it is a question, but I don't want to defer every single item. Is it yeah, around the change orders? So there's been multiple increases from the original contract amounts under those. Um, and so I'm wondering what, what those are coming from. Do you want to 
Maybe so. we can talk in, why don't you pull one and we'll talk and in we'll general. And we'll just talk in general? Okay. okay. So this full okay. item, I don't know, 10, 12. Okay. So there, um, will you amend your motion? So item 10, 7 and 10, 12. And amend second? Who did the second? Okay, thank you. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passed 7 0. Um, so item 10.7, Karen? Can you turn on your mic, Karen? Oh, I want you to talk to us a little bit more about your image making research based animal poetry workshops. I mean, I read about it, but. No, the, uh, we do offer uh, through the after school program uh, classes for the uh, K through uh, fifth grade in the uh, picture writing. Uh, K through uh, fifth, uh, picture writing. And the, uh, what is it called, writing? Uh, picture writing. Picture uh, writing. writing. Yeah, they, they do pictures and then they write about their pictures and okay. that's how they uh, actually improve their writing through their, the process of uh, doing a picture and then they actually write it. And I do have Wen who actually runs the program and she can probably explain that a little bit better. The, uh, we invited the, uh, the actual uh, uh, person that the, uh, created the uh, program to the uh, do training. Program? Uh? The animal poetry program, yes. you mean? Oh. So she's coming to uh, do training for our after school program uh, staff members to actually uh, uh, be able to improve the program and to be able to uh, recruit teachers after school, which is something that we're lacking in, in regards to improving our program that uh, we're having a difficult time the, uh, recruiting uh, qualified people to work after school and that's one way to actually uh, uh, bring more staff uh, to our after school program. To actually have them come and give trainings to teachers There's about one person that's going to come and do training to our staff. And, and they're coming about, and they're going to come about animal poetry workshops too. Yeah. Oh, and they're going to talk to staff, so staff would be more motivated and want to work in yes. the program. Oh, okay, that sounds good. Okay, is is that her? That, that's Gwen. Hey. She, she can Hi, Gwen. I know you. <laughs> Okay. If you could use the mic, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Gwen Berliner, and I um, work for the migrant program, 20%. I help to coordinate the migrant after school program. We have two parts of it. We have a literacy program, and we have a science program. A science program? Science. Okay. Yes. And um, to give just a really quick history, um, when, the, when we had to um, change our delivery of service, uh, Louise put um, Patricia Unruh and I in charge of trying to plan a migrant after school program. And so we decided to go with really active, hands on kind of activities. So we chose science and also a program called Picturing Writing. It integrates art with literacy. So the painting happens first, and then the writing is inspired by the painting. Uh, part of what I have right there is research on da the data on test scores that. Um, <laughs> have improved from this program. We felt like our students, after all day of the kind of work that they do, they were really tired after school, so we wanted them to be able to have a different kind of program. And this program starts with the artwork. It's really good for our second language learners. It's a kind of different kind of um, language, using the language of art. Mm -hmm. um, Beth Olszlansky is the founder of the program. That is who we are paying. We, we are asking you for the money to send her. She founded the program. And we've been using it for the, all these years. Okay. But um, we need to up our, we've been doing it for three years, and people are hungry for her to come. There's this amazing excitement right now as I tell people that we're going to bring her. And um, they, were, they used it at Ohlone School. Um, they've um, been using it throughout our district, and I've been using it. So it felt like the time was right to get her to come and do a training. We're actually going to do this training during our um, winter break. And um, part of the money is for supplemental pay for the migrant after school teachers who are doing this. As Louise was saying, it is a little tough getting after school program, getting regular classroom teachers to want to teach after school. There's a lot of enthusiasm for it, 
but I've lost about four of my best teachers just because they're so whole from what they're doing. They'll, they'll say things like, oh, but the math program is so intense or this or that. And so we really do need to get the excitement up so that we can keep the program going and bringing Beth Olszewski here will be part of how we can do that. Okay. So I'm hoping that that explains it. I, I do have a little presentation too, but um, yeah, if you have questions, I can definitely answer them. Okay, thank you. Oops, we didn't um, a lot time on the Yeah, I understand. I'm sorry. Yeah, I totally understand. But thank you. That, sound, that sounds awesome. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, it, so and it says poetry, but we've been doing all kinds of writing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the program, we, it, a lot of it is narrative. There's, it's descriptive. Uh, there, um, we, we start with poetry sometimes, but then move on. Poetry in and of itself is worth teaching, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. And I actually have some... Um, information on that too. So um, you can go to picturingwriting.org and her site comes up and then there is a link to her data that shows how test scores improved w in a year-long study in a school that she was helping to do it in. Wow. It's pretty impressive. I mean even as the kids do the writing, th there's also children's literature that they use. Mm -hmm. And um, from, from that plus reading their own books, there's a, there's it, it's a workshop, writer's workshop approach the kind of thing that we are doing now during our school day, Lucy Coffins, that kind of thing. And from the kids writing their own books and reading them, their, their reading scores go up. Okay. Well, I could go on and on, I know sure you're just late. <laughs> would you make sure to make a note of that website? Because I'd like to look it up. But thank you so much. Um, thank you. No, no, that's okay. Good to see you. <laughs> and they do have a showcase in the spring, uh, you're more than welcome to attend, and where they show the actual the, uh, the, the, the works that the students have done and completed throughout the year. And it's an amazing type of work that they actually do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion to approve that? Okay, oh, because we've asked them for two questions. Yeah, yeah, I'll make a motion now we approve the whole, whole consent. Well, no, just that one, item 10.7. Oh, 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 we've already done the other gen. Okay. Yeah, so item I'm, I'm approving that one. The, the motion one to item. approve 10.7. 10.7. Okay. I'll second that motion. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. And now we're on to 10.12. Um, Maria, you had questions on change orders. Yeah. So my question was more around how we can avoid those increases. I mean, that's funding that could be spent otherwise. Does by adding the different increases of all the change orders on tonight's agenda alone is over $127,000 spent in change orders. So what are we doing? Are we being proactive? Um, as far as you know, ensuring that we can save that money and spend it elsewhere. Good evening. Um, one of the systems that we we devised in order to replace under the Prop 39 uh, funding mechanism was to replace the heating systems at Watson High. Uh, unfortunately, the plans that we do follow Hold were the ones that we have archived. Victor, hi, it's Kim over here. I'm sorry, but it's 1020 and I need to make a motion to extend our meeting to 1045. Okay. So you're going to have to keep it brief. <laughs> Just kidding. You know, we can extend it again if we need to. So no, I'm. We can. Oh, we can't? Oh. We have this and one other okay, then I'm making actually a motion to extend to 11 if we need that. But we're shooting for 1145. 1045, not 1145. Uh, 1045. Okay. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, carry on. Just in general, because I'm just looking so for. So, in a nutshell, it's yeah, in a basically. Nutshell. In a nutshell, it's basically existing conditions from when it was originally built, and we do understand that Watsonville High School is very old. So, when we open up uh, walls in order to do the penetrations for the new HVAC systems at Watsonville High, we find that there's diagonal uh, diagonal uh, bracing and shear where it's not allowed anymore. So some of these change orders reflect basically changing the method and clearing a wall. And during the encounter of that, we need to abate all the stucco, all the surface uh, finishes in order to get into the diagonal sheeting. So this is a result of existing conditions. Okay. But moving oh, forward, no. I guess my question to you is moving forward, what can we do before we get shovel ready to ensure that we prevent that from happening, right? So that should have been part of the original contract, right? When you go into, Correct. right. 
Um, I, I think that should have been something that we, we needed to investigate. Well, you know, or at least be made aware that it will be probably a cost, an additional cost to the district. Correct. Yeah. This is not just in Watsonville High School. This is, I mean, multiple schools. So, so the unfortunate thing is that we don't, we can't see what's really has been built and how it was built. So that was means and methods at an early stage. So when we encounter this, this is something that we couldn't really foresee. And that's why we call it unforeseen conditions. Um, the unfortunate thing is that rules and laws are changing in order to mitigate. And so now that we're bound to the 2012 um, restrictions of Title 24, which is kind of like the rules to build anything, we need to even go further. And sometimes it results in a change order because it is additional work, but it is additional value also. Okay. I guess just moving forward, if we can be proactive if possible or when possible? If one, one good thing would have, you would know, be good. having it enough time to really do some demolition prior to the design of the project and making sure that we do understand what's behind that wall. There you go. And that's the type of, I think, uh, action that I want to see happening. I think that can save us some dollars. I'm sorry? That can save us some dollars. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, Victor. Okay. I'll make a motion okay. to approve this item. Is there item. a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Um, okay. We are on um, our last item, and that is upcoming meetings. We do um, have... Yes, we do. Thank you. <laughs> Um, item 13, and this is our action and report on closed session. Um, so uh, we had one expulsion. I'll ask Karen to read that out, and Maria will follow with the rest. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for full expulsion for the remainder of 2018 2019. Your mic isn't on. Okay. Second. Sir, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. And the okay. additional items, that, there was only one. Thank you. So under item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the certificated um, uh, personnel report as presented by the district administration. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Are there any abstentions? I just realized we were miss, missing trustee Acosta and close. Okay. And did you abstain from the last vote? Yes. Thank you. Is that noted? It wasn't a 7 0 vote. So it was 6. Trustee Acosta was not six, in closed zero, session. One. Both of those. Okay. Go ahead. So under item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of two legal absences. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? An abstention. Okay, thank you. Um, under item 2.4, the board approved with a 601 vote. Um, a separation settlement agreement for classified employee number 503. No, that was, we, we and, voted in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Under item 2.8, the board approved an MOU with Santa Cruz COE with, uh, for one special education student with a 06, no, 601 vote. And under item 2.9, um, the board approved an MOU with a Santa Cruz COE for one educational special student. And that's also with a 601 vote. And item 2.10, the board approved um, the comp uh, com compromise and release agreement for one special ed education student with a 601 vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we are on item 14, upcoming board meetings. Um, I do um, uh, need to 
ask for a motion to add our October 3rd uh, board self-evaluation meeting. Um, since we did complete the superintendent's evaluation last month and part of the board responsibilities is to do an annual board self-evaluation, um, which we will be doing on October 3rd. Um, that meeting will be 6 to 9 p.m. here and it is open to the public. Uh, following that meeting, uh, there will be uh, a, an open session agenda item to go over um, the results of that. Um, I just wanted to remind the board uh, to check your email. Our CSBA representative that's going to facilitate that has emailed us. It's in your inbox right now, so it's important that we read those and respond to the evaluations. So again, I'd like to um, ask for a motion to approve the upcoming board meetings with the addition of October 3rd special meeting. Can you ask a question? Yes. Uh, let's do a motion and a second, and then we'll ask the question. Move approval. I mean, yeah. <laughs> second. Okay. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Wally. <laughs> second was, was Kim. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Need your mic on. Is the October 3rd meeting open session mm -hmm. when, uh, when we do the board evaluation? Yes, it is. And then that's followed by what? You? It's it, um, the facilitator from the California School Board Association um, will write a report. She will bring it to us. And after that, and I failed to mention this, after that, we will bring our board policy forward on board governance. And we'll talk about yeah, um, how we're working together as a team, any changes that we feel like we need to make okay. or none, and Good. then make recommendations for updated board policy. We've been bringing board policies along for the last year, and this is one of them. Okay. Okay. Good. I just wanted to right. clarify. Thank you. Oftentimes the uh, board um, review is, is, is not um, open, open it, session, but the results are brought forth in an open session. No, they're always open to are the they? public. We just don't have anyone come. The, yeah, superintendent's evaluation is closed. You guys okay. got that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice Thank you. Okay. I'm good. All right. So there's a motion and a second. So I will ask for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes 601 with trust 610 with trustee Acosta dissenting. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.